My name is Elizabeth. I am 24 years old. I was a Jehovah's Witness and I am shunned. All right. So how did you come to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? Um, I usually say I was born into it because I was a baby when my parents uh, converted. So to me, I've known nothing else from that young age forward, obviously until I left. Um, but my family on my dad's side, my uncle actually was the first one to be contacted. I believe it was through a door to door ministry. Um, he converted when my dad was still living at home, a teenager. He was the older brother who converted. Um, and my grandma, who was a school teacher, um, she was a science teacher. She was very logical and, uh, not very religious. And so wasn't very trusting of this and said, what is my son getting into? Um, I need to learn about it. And so she agreed to a Bible study to learn about it wow. and converted. So she then converted. And then it was just my grandpa and my dad left who had not converted yet. Um, and he never did through his entire time at home, neither did my grandfather. Um, and then throughout my dad's like teenagehood, he was always considered the rebel. Like he had a rock band and, <clears throat> did concerts well into his early adulthood and um, was always considered the black sheep of the family. And whenever he'd get in trouble, uh, my grandma as punishment would make him have a study with an elder in their congregation. Uh, hey, so, it's a punishment. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, the irony. Um, and so he, uh, he learned everything about, I mean, he had a lot of studies because he was not a very good kid. Um, so uh, he learned a lot about it, and uh, he always said later in life that he he knew it was the truth. He just wasn't ready for it because he liked his lifestyle um, and liked like his liked his rebelliousness. And so um, he always had the knowledge in his head, though. Just as he said, was never in his heart. Um, my grandfather never converted all the way until until he died. Um, so then flipped to my mom's side. She comes from a pretty big family. Um, I have five uncles. She's the only girl and the youngest. Um, and she was always very religious, but she was the black sheep for being religious. The rest of her family was um, a little bit more on the wild side. Um, she had some some crazy, not great stories about her childhood, police being called to the house multiple times, that kind of thing. Um, but so she leaned very heavily into religion. So I think that she was raised um, Lutheran. But she had a friend who was Catholic and used to go to Catholic youth camp with her and really enjoyed that religion. Um, so that's kind of who they both were. Um, that's their backgrounds. Well, then fast forward, my dad, although a rebel, was very scholarly, kind of like my grandma. And he uh, ended up getting his degree and becoming a librarian. Um, still doing rock on the side. <laughs> and a rock mom, star yeah. librarian. I like yeah. it. <laughs> Um, and then my mom, I think she just got like a job at the library he worked at, just, you know, putting books on shelves or something. So they met there at the library, um, started dating, eventually got married. Um, and my mom told him straight up from the beginning, like, Hey, I'm really religious. I, I want to go to church. I want to keep this in my life. And he was like, that's fine. Just don't make me do it. And she was like, well, as long as you believe in Jesus. And he was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Um, so they got married, had my brother, I have an older brother. And apparently, uh, when he was a couple years old, I think about two, because I was, I'm three years younger than my brother. Um, so when he was about two, my mom had, hadn't been going to church. My dad wasn't obviously going to church. Um, they were pretty, having not a great time. Their marriage was pretty rough. And my mom said, hey, I need, I need religion. I need something. Will you please do something with me? And my dad told her, well, uh, the only religion I've ever been remotely interested in and think has it right is Jehovah's Witnesses. So if you want to be religious, the only religion I'm willing to look into is that. And so if you want to be religious, let's set up a Bible study with my mom's church. So they did. Um, started studying with the Witnesses. I think about two years, maybe, they were baptized. Uh, Full-fledged members of the congregation. At that point, I think I was one. Um, and so that's how my family kind of jumped in there and my dad finally said, yeah, I'll embrace it. I have a family, whatever. And my mom just wanted religion. And this, they obviously took her in with open arms. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure they did. Um, it's fascinating how many times people seem to become Jehovah's Witnesses or be drawn to it because they have little kids or their family situation is not great at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's that that vulnerability. They're yeah. looking for 
religion for their kids, a, a way forward, hope, whatever it is for them. Mm -hmm. um, and religion is often the thing that people turn to for that. Yeah, for um, sure. And so, um, so your dad's punishment has now become the uh, the, the lifestyle the bedrock of his family. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so interesting. Um, so you all, your parents obviously go into this thing. Uh, you are now a little kid. I think you said you were one uh, at that time. So it's pretty much all you knew. Mm -hmm. What was the worldview that you were given as a little kid growing up? How did it make you see yourself in the world around you? Um, well, I'll start with my, my school time was limited. I went to um, public school for elementary school, and that's it. I was homeschooled for middle school and high school. Um, and my brother was public school for elementary school and middle school. And then when he started high school, because of the three-year age difference, when he was going into high school, I was going into middle school. And um, my parents basically said, well, uh, Evan, my brother, um, is not having a great time at school. He's bullied a lot. My brother's a little bit of a nerd. <laughs> and uh, he needs to be taken out and just finish up school at high school because it's not going to be good for him in high school if it wasn't good for him in middle school. Um, I, on the other hand, I mean, I only had elementary school, so it's not like I was the shit or anything. <laughs> I was like, an eight, what, eight years old, 10 years old? I don't even remember how old you are in school. Anyways, um, so uh, my parents said, well, Elizabeth has ADHD. We don't think she'll be able to handle classroom changes. And frankly, who needs these worldly people? Let's just pull them both out. Um, so they pulled both of us out. I will say uh, my elementary school, I loved public school. I was pulled out kicking and screaming. I was not a fan. Um, and uh, I just felt like I had a really good time. Like, I remember in fifth grade, we for the last year, we went to dance. And I remember I like secretly asked my boy crush in the class to go with me to the dance. And of course, because we're awkward fifth graders, we didn't even talk to each other at the dance we agreed <laughs> to go to. But I felt like such a rebel for doing that. And I loved it. I had a really great time. I had a really big friend group. Obviously, they all knew I couldn't hang out with them outside of school, couldn't do any extracurriculars, um, any of that. But um, I... I think that the biggest thing was then after that, when I was homeschooled, my whole world was just witnesses because I, that was as a kid, you're really only your connection to outside of that is to be going to public school, at least for me. Um, I will say I have lived in like a cul-de-sac and I had neighbors on both sides of my house that had kids my age and I would play outside with them every now and then. But I mean, once I hit middle school age, um, one year into middle school, we moved. Um, so I'm actually from Florida. I'm from like Tampa area. Um, so that's kind of where I had my whole childhood. So we moved when I was 12, right about to turn 13 to Tennessee, um, to Knoxville, because my dad got a job at a mortgage company that I now work at. And he still works at fun fact. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> Um, so he got, he's a tech guy. So after he left working at the library, um, eventually he, uh, is a self-taught computer programmer. And so he actually worked for a company early on when he, my dad, mom were married. That was a, uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was related to like the U S government. And I remember my dad left that job once he converted, cause he thought that that wasn't, you know, staying neutral. Um, so he moved to a different couple different jobs where he did that, but then eventually he got poached for a job in Knoxville, Tennessee. So we moved up here. So I had those neighborhood friends for elementary school and like the first two years of middle school. And then we moved. And so then I truly only had the witness world because it, it was Tennessee. It was a lot more rural. Um, we didn't have any kids in my neighborhood. So I never knew any of my neighbors. Um, I was again, still fully homeschooled. And I was new to the area, so I didn't know anybody except for my congregation, because where else do you meet people? Um, so my worldview at that point was very, like, witness specific. Like, I didn't, I did not know anything else. Like, looking back, it's almost mind-boggling how ignorant I was to the world. Well, sure. Um, you know? Did you find, I don't know, for myself, uh, being an ADD kid, uh, ADHD kid, thinking about... How, I, you know, I went through public school the whole way, but mm -hmm. thinking about being homeschooled, 
uh, would have probably been horrible because I don't think I would have done anything uh, that I was so supposed to do as far as schoolwork uh, without so that external motivation. So I, I had zero motivation. Um, yeah. For middle school, I went through a program called Florida Virtual School because we still had our Florida address. And so it was free to do. And you had like a real classroom and a real teacher. It was just all virtual. Oh, nice. Um, so that was really, really great for me. I did great in middle school. But then for high school, my mom said, hey, you're going to do Penn Foster. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh, yes. Yep. It's just the written books mm-hmm. and written, hand, like printed out tests. And she said... I shit you not. We want you to start. Well, I was already at the time, um, not regular auxiliary pioneering, like on the side with my homeschooling. So I was already doing that. And she said, okay, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to do this. You're going to Google every single answer and you're going to graduate early. So you can regular pioneer because you don't need this information anyways, because you're not going to college. And you're probably at the time I wanted to be a hairdresser. So she's like, you're just going to go to cosmetology school. You don't need this. And even if you don't do cosmetology school, you still don't need this. And I was like, yeah, mom, sounds great. I don't have to do school. Yeah. Cause I'm a stupid 16 year old. <laughs> so I did not have, that's something I'm very honestly self-conscious about I don't have an education my schooling is shit and um so I googled all the answers um graduated when I was 16 and regular pioneered for a couple years and thus you have uh most Jehovah's Witnesses views (laughs) on education clearly not all some some value it Mm -hmm. um but the you know the education that matters the most is the education uh within Jehovah's organization the you know what was it reading the awake magazine the is only supposed school to be like I want to get a good grade in is the ministry school. Yeah, you say you graduated the ministry school. Yeah. Yeah, there <laughs> you go. The one I want to graduate from. Yes, yes, and so it's it's not um, it's just not a healthy environment for kids. I mean, I think mm-hmm. you know most quote worldly people, most people in the regular world would see taking your kids out of school and then not teaching them anything or putting them in school as neglect or truancy. Uh, but for Jehovah's Witnesses, it's just part of their religious indoctrination. And why why are you going to need this information in the new system? This is just Satan's world. You don't need this. Yeah, it's really yeah. sad um, because they're foregoing the one life that we know we have for some you know dream of the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it doesn't, Mm -hmm. this life doesn't matter to them. Um, so also being homeschooled, um, you were now more isolated because you're not around other kids, your age. Did you have friends? What what about at the kingdom hall? Did you have friends there? Did you feel like you fit in, uh, at least maybe there after you moved? So my Florida life and my Tennessee life, I feel are like so different. So, and I know that it's only the first 12 years of my life. Well, that's half my life actually. Now that I think about it. So the first half of my life, which it doesn't feel like that, but um, the first half of my life in Florida. So my dad was an elder and I think he still is, I'm guessing. I don't know. It's been three years, four years. So maybe he's not anymore. Um, but when I left, he was still an elder. Um, he became an elder when I was, still a very little kid. I don't remember how old I was, but that's really all I remember. I don't remember him ever being anything but an elder. Um, And then my mom regular pioneered on and off through the years. Um, And so we were in Florida, we were considered the strict family. So, I mean, I just remember, this is one of the things that like, I look back on now and like, I just can't believe that we ever thought it was okay. Like, I just remember my family talking crap about other families constantly. Oh, yes. That's a witness thing. Yes. Yes. And so because we were, my dad was an elder, my mom was already a pioneer. We were the kids who were already unbaptized publishers before they probably had diapers off them. And um, I just remember, like, all of the kids in the congregation, like, there was maybe, like, two kids my parents were okay with and didn't think were, like bad association in the congregation or too weak for the family but I just remember like judging I mean I remember telling one of my my best friend well she's not anymore but my best friend at the time her name was Kaya um and god we were inseparable and I remember we lived in the same neighborhood like one block away from each other so we used to walk to each other's houses I remember walking through the neighborhood one day and she had on a pair of jean shorts we were probably like nine or ten 
And I remember telling her that her shorts were too short and she might not get into the new system because of it or get into paradise because of it. Cause that's what I hear my parents saying that like, they're not going to like, look at how they let their kid dress. Like that's not good. Um, God, I was a bitch as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, mean, but I, mean, I just parroted that stuff that I heard my parents saying, you know? Yeah, you're so. you're just being a little reflection of where the environment that you're coming from, right? You didn't make this up. This was put into you. Yeah. So I, but anyways, I did, although my parents definitely were like overly skeptical of everyone and so because that all the kids thought we were the strict ones like I we were always the most modestly dressed and couldn't watch the most things and god we had a clear play have you ever heard of a clear play Ooh, no but I think I can guess play. what that might be it is a dvd player where you download filters so you can watch any movie and it just skips the scenes with bad things in it there you go so my dad had one of those so we could watch, he put like PG movies in that. He, it didn't matter what the rating was. He put it in there and he always had the same settings on, skipped like anything remote. God, do you have any idea how much of The Office I missed because I was watching The Office through Clear Play Filter? <laughs> I mean, half the show is that's what she said and I didn't hear any of it. So. That's um, crazy. So, yeah. and who, I guess, uh, Clear play. Who developed that? Do you know where that no comes idea. from? No okay. idea. I my dad found it online. I don't know. It was a, just an actual DVD player and had a little loot USB. He'd go on their website and download what filter settings he wanted. And I don't know if they still make it, but we were that family in the congregation. So, um, but at the same time, though, we also we were the ones who had uh, the Thursday Bible study night at our house. Um, we were the ones in our our neighborhood. So I remember cleaning for that every. Uh, Thursday afternoon beforehand and then obviously on Saturdays before the field service group came to meet at our house um, and we loved our bible study group it was a lot of like young couples and so they were a lot of fun we'd have almost every Thursday we would have like snacks afterwards and everybody would bring something we'd all hang out and have a good time um, and we I mean we were really really social even though they were judging half the people in the congregation we had people over basically every weekend. I remember we had like huge Mario Kart tournaments and like rock band we played a lot of because my dad, although no longer a rock, rock, not rock star, I don't know what to call him, a rock musician, that's the word. Um, he still loved music. We had a studio, our garage was converted into a studio. So he used to like record his own stuff. And um, so I still, I have a very uh, cultured music background. He he filtered movies, but he did not filter music, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, really? No clear yeah, play he, for music. Well, I think for him, it's just so, it was so, um, what's the word? Uh, uh, sentimental. Like, it, it was so, um, like, embedded in him, and that's just part of who he was. And so I think he really appreciated that. Like, I think he definitely held back some music until we were older, but uh, I definitely grew up, like, on the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. His band was a Pink Floyd cover band um super tramp like all that so I I love all that but um we used to have a lot of fun parties and, and cool stuff at our house um but then when we moved to Tennessee we were the loose family in comparison which was weird for us like it was very very strange for me to have grown up thinking I'm in the strict family and all of my friends would tell me how we were the strict family and I moved to Tennessee and we were immediately the ones being judged by everybody welcome to the bible belt <laughs> yeah let me tell you it was an adjustment yeah um so like I one of the like biggest things that stands out to me for like an example of this my dad was still an elder in the con in, in the new congregation um he was always the voice of reason in that elder group um, but, uh, he, I remember at one point we had a special needs on drinking and the brother giving the special needs talk was saying that his wife, just his wife, not anybody else, but his wife usually is good after one or two glasses of wine. And so that's what everybody else should be good with, or at least all the women in the congregation. Yeah. And I remember afterwards, like half the congregation came up to my dad and was like, is he serious? Can we only have like two glasses of wine? And my dad was really like, no, like, I don't know where that came from. None of us approved that talk. Like, y'all drink, it's fine. <laughs> um, obviously not in excess, but like that brother is, it's brother Gensimer. He's just out there doing his thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, he clearly went above and beyond. Yeah, so, I, and I, God, I even remember we had a convention once where they 
called out specifically the Hunger Games and said the Hunger Games is a bad movie series. You could not watch it. And half my congregation had had like a viewing party for it like a couple of weeks ago and all gone to see it together. And everybody afterwards came to my dad and was like, what do we do? And he's like, it's fine. Don't listen to them. Like, they're just saying, use your reason. Like, don't worry about it. So my dad was, was good at being the voice of reason with that stuff, but it was definitely a huge adjustment because previously we were always the ones saying the stuff that was crazy off the wall, limiting, like having skirts only below your knee. <laughs> um, Interesting. So, so it was, it was a big adjustment. And because of that, a lot of the people in the congregation didn't like us super early on. It took a while, I think, for them to uh, warm up to us. There wasn't really anybody my age. They were all my brother's age. They were a couple of years older than me. And so um, most of the time, if I wanted to really have fun with friends, I would go and visit my friends in Florida. Or at the time, again, my best friend, Kaya, she had moved to California and she was uh, out there a lot. So I used to go spend like three to four weeks with her at a time um, and go out and stay with her. So <clears throat> interesting so you've seen florida you've seen tennessee you're going to see kaya in california mm -hmm. did you experience a different brand or version yes. of being one of jehovah's witnesses in california For sure. um because she was in san diego and her congregation had a large hispanic population and she also so well this was when we were older so never mind about that part but um there was a big hispanic population i remember the first moment to visit her we went to um one of her friends like she had like a party and they were hispanic and so there was like salsa dancing and everything and i remember this random boy like came up and asked me to dance and everybody like thought it was normal and i was like i'm allowed to dance with boys <laughs> um so i just remember doing that and uh having like a really great time but i was just really surprised everybody seemed so like it was just so, I, it was the culture. I mean, for them, like dancing with the opposite sex, that's not anything crazy or uh, untorn or like sexualized or whatever. It's just their culture. And so I think that that was a big, uh, big difference there. But I remember that being so exciting. And of course, this guy, I don't even know how old he was. I don't remember his name was. I don't remember anything about him. All I remember is afterwards being like, I have a crush on him, of course, because it's the first boy to ever show me attention, really. That oh, sure. You know, you know, frowned on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, in my congregation growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, you weren't even allowed to talk to members of the opposite sex who were in your peer group. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk to the girls. I wasn't in our allowed home. to have any boys' phone numbers like that were from my, my, my brother's friend group. Like in Florida, I remember I wasn't allowed to, but of course, all the other kids had each other's phone numbers. So, again, another example of us being the strict ones. And then we get to Tennessee, and like you said, we couldn't even like talk to them in the Kingdom Hall, let alone have their phone numbers. And so, me walking up to Evan and his friends, they were like, What's she doing? Why is she trying to talk to those boys? So, Again, it's just so, so different. It was very different. I remember we also had for, because uh, tons of people homeschooled in this area. And so I remember we kind of had, I guess, looking back, it's kind of like a prom kind of a thing for the homeschool group. It was just a formal dance um, where all the witnesses went. But of course, none of the boys and girls danced together. It was like a segregated dance floor, basically. And I remember doing that and hanging out with just like one of my friends off to the side the entire time. I didn't even want to dance because it was so weird. <laughs> so... Every time one of those happened in our area, it ended up being scandalous in some way. Um, the, the, it yeah. was there was always someone got upset about something, and so it could never really happen. On you know, you just weren't allowed to have that kind of fun as a kid <laughs> at all. Yeah. Um, so you kind of touched on school life, kind of how you all were. Mm -hmm getting along with the congregation what about your family just at home uh you know what, uh, what was what was the temperature of the room at home I'm not gonna lie I love my family mm -hmm. I still love them like they I had a really great childhood to be honest um like obviously outside of all of that um <laughs> my, when, like we lived in Florida my parents were really big Disney fans we had the like I don't know if you know this is like the vacation club membership so basically a Disney timeshare um, oh, yes, I've heard of this. And so we, gosh, at, at least once a month, we were going and staying for the weekend at Disney and going to the parks. And so I was a big Disney kid. I still love Disney. Um, that was like a big core thing with my childhood that I remember. And I mean, even up until I left when my brother got married, like 
<clears throat> those vacation club points accumulate. So they had hundreds of points every year. So we would randomly just go down to Florida and stay there and go to the parks and stuff. And um, I think they gifted that to my brother and sister-in-law for their honeymoon. Um, but so we did that a lot. Like I said, they were really social. They really did go out of their way to make sure that we were having a good time. Um, when we, when my parents first converted, we were going to my grandma's congregation, um, obviously, cause that's who we knew. And sure. that congregation was in like, <laughs> it, we were in Florida. So obviously there's already a lot of uh, older senior citizens, but this was in like, their territory was basically like the senior center of this area. So it was a lot of older people and zero kids, none at all. Um, the only kid I remember, her name is Brianna and they moved like two years after we joined the congregation. Um, and so like my parents felt really bad. Like I used to cry about it as a kid and like my parents would comfort me. And so they felt really bad and wanted to look for another congregation to go to. And one day we were sitting in a Sunny's barbecue restaurant and uh, I remember this is one of those things where they're like, ah, oh, this was Jehovah directing things. Um, we walk into this restaurant, the entire restaurant's empty, like not a single, there's like two booths filled and they seat us like back to back with another booth. And my parents were really annoyed because they're like, oh, we have two kids and they of course see us next to this table of people. We're going to just annoy them the whole time because they were talking about like the watchtower this coming Sunday and the booth next to us turns around and goes, are you guys Jehovah's Witnesses? And we're like, Yeah. And they're like, we are too. We go to this congregation over here. Here's our two young kids. There's tons of young kids in this congregation. You should come here. So we started going to that kingdom hall and became really tight with that family. Um, so Jehovah's Spirit in action. Of course. Um, so my parents, you know, went out of their way to make sure we had friends and, and were being taken care of. And um, again, we were the strict family, which stunk. Like I used to, um, <laughs> I used to write a lot of fan fiction. <laughs> Uh, when I was a kid, uh, not about anything mainstream. It was like, do you know the band Muse? Oh, yeah. I wrote so much fan fiction about that damn band. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, this is pretty so cool. Me and Kaya did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wasn't allowed to. So anytime my parents would find it on our, like, she had a laptop she'd write it on. And I did that for a little while, my homeschool laptop, until they found it. And I got grounded for weeks for fantasizing about a worldly band. Um and so then I just switched to writing it on pen and paper and hiding it under my bed or something. <clears throat> they never found that. But anyways, um, so uh, it was definitely strict and I frequently got in trouble. I was the black sheep of my family. Like I'd message people online and like that kind of stuff. And it was never anything like bad. Like I never encountered anything crazy, but they were just worldly people. So why are you pursuing those relationships? Um so they were pretty strict, but they really watched out for us. They cared about having like a good time, make sure we having a good time. And then when we moved to uh, Tennessee, that was a really big adjustment. My mom went through a lot of depression just because the same reason that I was saying about just not being accepted. And she really struggled with that, as did the rest of the family. Um, and so I remember her struggling a lot. But um, again, like she went out of her way to make sure that we were still like, be, they were being attentive to us and taking care of us and making sure we had a good uh, livelihood. Like we were pretty middle class, if not slightly upper middle class. I mean, I never remember them ever worrying about money. And um, my mom was a full-time stay-at-home mom. Um, and like I said, regular pioneered on and off for most of that. But uh, they just were really great. And I think that when I became an adult too, like later in life, um, I left when I was 20, but, uh, I moved to Florida when I was 17, actually, I moved out. My parents let me, um, because I missed Florida. Tennessee had never really become home over those years. And so I moved back to Florida and they let me move out two months before I turned 18. And I moved in with a sister that they really trusted. And like, they were cool with that. They, they keep in touch. My mom went on a trip with me to South Korea because, we'll get there, but I was going to move there. And so she wanted to see the area. And so uh, I was really into K-pop because of that at the time. And so she would listen to K-pop with me. She loved it. She went to some concerts with me. Like they just went out of their way to make us feel included and, and like accepted and normal and like showed interest in our stuff. Like I just felt like we had a really great and healthy childhood overall. They were just strict, but well, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, there's, that's, that's the dichotomy of any of it. I mean, yeah, on one hand, and it sounds like your parents, maybe more than a lot of parents, seem to 
want you guys to have fun, wanted you to feel included, wanted you to feel accepted, Mm -hmm. and tried to have a great time with you all. Um, At the same time, though, they're not allowing to express you to express your self right you know that, that, that good that's education which as it turns out is valuable <laughs> right and having an education so yeah. you know and and this is Too part excellent. of why things like this are so confusing because mm-hmm. we have people that do care about us but at the same time they could only care about us so far or because of their care they felt like they needed to squash certain parts of us mm-hmm. to keep us small you know, you talked about being the black sheep of the family to some degree. So there are these these areas where they do come in and when part of ourself may present that they don't approve of, suddenly mm-hmm. that part is cut off. Oh yeah. I was that was oh. kind of circling back to like the black sheep thing. Like I always wanted like edgy styles and edgy hair. Like I I pushed I pushed the envelope wanting to dye my hair red. But my mom said, you can dye your hair any color. She was very accepting of me dyeing my hair. She said, you can dye your hair of any color you want, as long as you can make an argument that it could technically be natural. So I remember I I did like a like deep purpley red. And I was like, there's redheads. So um, I remember doing that. Like I shaved, like basically shaved my head once and had like this really short, short pixie cut. Um, And then like I did like the blunt bangs and like I had an undercut under my hair that was hidden and so I was always looking to do like really edgy hairstyles and I always pushed the envelope with my parents on that. They always gave me tons of crap about it. Um, and then even my style, like too, like I never wanted to wear anything, I guess, immodest, but I definitely wanted to like, like I remember when I was in elementary school, I wanted to wear black jeans with a black t-shirt and my mom told me no, because I'd look goth. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like things like that, I always wanted to dress a little more edgy and like it's interesting now because I don't think I do dress super edgy or necessarily look super edgy, but it's because I realized that I just wanted so badly to like look different than everybody else around me and not like be identified as a witness. Like I remember I used to take pride as a younger adult when people would be surprised when I tell them I was a witness and I'd be like, yeah, that's right. We're cool. We don't, we're not all the same. And so I used to like be really proud of that. And so now looking back, I'm like, oh, it was just me really wanting to like not be identified as that in public. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, and realizing it. You, you see that a lot, even in the congregation. Sometimes people will wear, uh, we had a sister who wore crazy hats and like that, but that was just her trying to be, she was trying to individuate in some way mm-hmm. instead of just being one of the many. Yeah. There's, you know, people want to be individuals. And when that is, and so that even gets back to like in your family, so yes, you're feeling this acceptance, but that acceptance has a limit. Mm-hmm. Within a box, you can go right. anywhere in this box. <laughs> right, and so once you get past that, you see that that acceptance is suddenly completely gone. Mm-hmm. It vanishes, and and I think that's what a lot of people are trying to do. They're just trying to be themselves in some way. But I mean, it's kind of hard. A cult doesn't want you to be yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, 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 they ha- there has to be a stop there. There has to be a limiter. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, so you, but it, I'm glad that you have these wonderful memories. It sounds like that you got yes. to walk away with these really good experiences, things that, um, that are really beautiful, but I'm sure that then that makes it harder in its own way, you know, on the backside, if you're shunned by these people, you know, later yeah. on. Um, For sure. Of course. Um, and that's why, you know, all of this is so confusing. That's why in the end, uh, it hurts so much because there, there is this dichotomy, this duality that, that goes on. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's a really tough thing to come to terms with. Mm-hmm. Uh, humans are very complex. Uh, and so are yeah. relationships. Um, so <clears throat> you all went to Tennessee. When did you get back? baptized where was that in your story i got baptized in florida so i was a uh, elderly 12 years old oh okay yeah and so i remember um when i told my parents I, I asked my parents never pushed it um but i asked and said hey i think i'm ready to be baptized and my parents were like mm, you're a little young and i said well i really want it i already have said my dedication prayer to jehovah in prayer so uh what you gonna do about it basically (laughs) 
And they said, all right, well, you know what? If you can uh, do the, I don't even remember what they call it, the question thing they do with the elders where you can meet with them three times and go through the book. I don't mm-hmm. remember the name of Reasoning from the Scriptures. Was that it? No, uh, Organized to Accomplish Our Ministry. The OM book is what it used to be called. Okay. So that, and they may have, uh, Reasoning book was the one you, the brown book out in service with all the points you could argue. Oh, yes, people. yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't know. They, they may have a new book today that has replaced the OM book. I, I don't know. Yeah. So whatever that book was, um, they said, if you can pass through all the questions, you know what? In that case, that means that you probably understand it and that you can get baptized. And so I did it. I understood it. Um, like I said, like my family was very, we never missed meetings. We, I will say when we went on vacation, like we didn't go to meetings. Um, so I'll give them that. <laughs> but oh, you all were terrible witnesses. I know. <laughs> when we were at home, though, we never missed meetings and sure. we never missed family study night once they moved it to having that as an option ever. And also we always had, in addition to family study night, separate study night with my dad and my brother and then me and my mom. Um, so <clears throat> we did it all. So you had two so you had a family study Mm -hmm. and an individual study with a parent yes okay yeah it's a lot and then obviously we had to uh independently prepare for each meeting and have an answer ready for each meeting from the heart could not be read from the book um so my parents would check to make sure we highlighted and had an answer ready and everything before each meeting um so like it was I was pretty knowledgeable. Like I didn't, I wasn't really worried about passing these questions. Um, and so I did, and I got baptized when I was 12. And let me just tell you hundred percent. I got baptized because I wanted to do it before my brother. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. <laughs> he wasn't okay. baptized yet. <laughs> and I thought I was the shit for getting baptized before him. <laughs> But doesn't that go back to, you know, the way you all maybe saw other families and stuff and were kind of judgy of the way mm-hmm. people were? So then here oh, you yeah. are probably wanting to be more righteous yeah, or whatever the case than some For sure. I was, I was in the bragging point for my family. I was the only baptized kid in the congregation, like, or the youngest at least. Um, I mean, most of my friends who eventually did got baptized got baptized like between like 15 and 17 in age. So like a little bit more... I'm not going to say they were mature. They were still teenagers, but at least they weren't 12. That's the thing that really gets me nowadays is the fact that one decision I made when I was 12 years old is the reason my family doesn't talk to me anymore. It's just insane. That's what gets me. Yeah, it's really awful. A dedicated dedication a 12-year-old made and hold that against them. Okay. Well, yes. And can we also add that that 12-year-old had no other choices? And have been exposed to nothing else. So is it really a choice if there's only one choice? That's kind of the thing I've thought about in, I mean, don't get me wrong. It makes me angry that it's about a 12 year old's choice, but at the same time, let's be real. I didn't leave until I was 20. If it wasn't when I was 12, it would have been another time. So what's really the difference? Sure. Well, because of the indoctrination and the undue influence, Mm -hmm. you had no other choices. So this is, this is the one path that was set before you. You weren't offered a variety of paths. It wasn't if, it was when. Yeah. And, so. you know, a 12-year-old, baptizing 12-year-olds is certainly way better than baptizing infants because infants don't yeah. know anything. And 12-year-olds, I mean, 12-year-olds are well known um, as bastions of wisdom. decisions. Yes, yes. We, we should really let 12-year-olds make more decisions. I, think. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't even give a full on presentation at the door. I was still just the one handing magazines out after my mom finished. (laughs) Uh, Anyways. Yeah, it's uh, ridiculous. Yeah, a little bit. So so I got baptized then. I don't remember what we were talking about before I got on that track about being 12. Oh, I did it because my brother wasn't yet. I think my brother ended up being like 16 when I got baptized or when he got baptized. Um, But man, he messed up later in life almost as bad as I did. (laughs) He uh, eventually met his uh, now wife. They've been together for seven years now, um, which is crazy because I feel like he's still a baby, but it's fine. Um, They met when at that dance I told you about that we had the homeschool prom dance. She, her parents were traveling because her dad traveled for work um, for the state, like fixing like meters at different like state plate, like schools and office buildings and things like that and so they just happened to be in Tennessee and we're going to our sister congregation that shared the kingdom hall with us and um they all went to the dance because she was homeschooled since they were always on the road 
and met there. He was 16 and she was 15. So imagine that. Um, they secretly exchanged, get this, email addresses because can't have that phone number. No, 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 no. And started emailing back and forth. And um, at the time, so this, I forgot, I just forgot about this. My family, as soon as we got cell phones, my parents took both of our phones every single night um, and kept them in their bedrooms to charge them and to also read through and make sure we weren't doing anything inappropriate. So they'd like check our texts and our photos and like whatever. Um, so the thing is though, my brother was the goody two shoes of the family, never did anything wrong ever. And so when he started dating or secretly, I guess you could say dating Alexa, um, got their emails from each other, started emailing each other. And then they eventually got bold and did exchange phone numbers and start texting each other. And we weren't allowed to delete text messages, obviously. So this little sucker never did delete his text messages but they dated for a solid year and a half because my parents never checked his phone ever because they trusted him so much. They took oh. his phone every night, but never checked it. Only why? Because <laughs> um, they trusted him so much and didn't think that he would ever do anything. And then they, he never deleted them. They were right there. He just never looked. But then one morning, Alexa fucked up and texted him good morning before he'd come to get his phone from them. And they saw the picture and were like, is Alexa opened his phone and found a treasure trove and find all of their text messages and uh, spend like the entire morning reading through them, flip out because my parents had five rules about dating. You had to be both 18 because obviously the whole point of dating is for marriage. So if you're not 18, you can't get married. You'd be both 18, both have to be financially independent. You both have to be mentally mature. You both have to be spiritually mature. And there was one more that I don't remember what it was. I don't remember. I'm sorry. But there were five rules. I remember that. They didn't meet any of them because they weren't 18. Neither of them had jobs, like nothing. They're both baptized. I'll give them that. Um, they were just kids doing what yes. kids do. They yes. And so um, normal kids date. My parents said, so my mom said, we need to cut this off. We need to delete the phone numbers. We need to punish him. They can't talk to each other ever again. And my dad said, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're teenagers. They're not stupid. They'll just find another way to talk to each other if we do that. And we'll just push back harder. So let's, let's put them on a leash, keep it a tight leash, but let it happen. So they agreed that they would let Evan and Alexa keep dating. They were long distance because she'd already moved at that time. Um, but they got to still read their texts every day and see what was going on and keep an eye on things, make sure nothing weird was happening. She'd come and visit and they'd keep a chaperoned, um, which because my parents were, I'm going to use the word lazy, uh, they never wanted to chaperone them. So I always chaperoned them because I'm the little sister and I don't have anything better to be doing anyways. Um, so I always chaperone them everywhere. God, I remember one night I was in my pajamas. It was like 10 o'clock at night. And they're like, they want to go out for a drive. Can you go with them? And I'm like, why don't you go with them? I don't want to. And they were like, we don't want to either. I'm like, it's your kid. I don't want to go. <laughs> they made me go. So anyways, there was also another point in time where they paid me $40 to let them make out in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe I took that deal. <laughs> um, I went and sat in the bathroom and waited for them to tell me I could come out. <laughs> um, so, like, that's what you get for letting a 13-year-old, 14-year-old chaperone, okay, guys? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, it's so, all ridiculous, uh, but... They yeah. got married the, like, month after Alexa turned 18. My brother was a year older, so he was 19. Um, and they've been together seven years, so must be going well. Okay. I still check up her on her Instagram because she's not private. So <laughs> seems okay. to be great. This got a new dog. <laughs> okay, but there's so there it sounds then like they're still Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So you get baptized at 12 years old. I know you, you had already mentioned that once you went into high school, the expectation was for you to pioneer. Um, so obviously baptism being a prerequisite for that, mm -hmm. uh, once you got baptized, did the pressure ramp up more for you to participate um, in things? I would say so. And I think it was just because, like I said, like with the school, they were like, well, what else are you going to do with your time? Like, that's what 
that's what we're here for. That's what we're supposed to do. And so um, I did have a part-time job. I got a part-time job as soon as I finished high school because they did want me to, you know, have income and be financially independent. Um, okay. They were pretty, pretty for that. Um, so I just worked at like a little cafe restaurant thing a couple of days a week. And I became best friends with the baker there who was worldly. Um, and we used to, cause even then I was 16, 17. So my parents still took my phone every night. So I'd message him on Instagram on the like little chat thing on there. Um, so my parents never checked his messages because I don't think they knew that existed. Um, so, and we, it was never romantic. Like he had a fiance and like, he was like a two or three years older than me. Um, so he's like early twenties and, um, it was never romantic or anything. We just really good friends and just got along really well. And so we used to also like he knew my situation, everything. And we used to like meet up at the mall after work. And he'd be like, Hey, I'm like just going to the mall to like run some errands. Do you, do you think you'll happen to be at the mall? And I was like, yeah, I think I'll happen to be at the mall too. That'd be crazy if we ran into each other. And then we just go meet at the mall and like go shopping. Um, so I had him, he was my first worldly friend. Um, and it, I, gosh, I remember when I, uh, moved back to Florida. So I moved back to Florida, like I said, when I was just about turning 17. So I left my job at that bakery cafe and moved there. And we'd still like FaceTime for hours, like every now and then and just talk. Like he was just a really good friend and I'm still in touch with him today. He made my wedding cake. Um, oh, so awesome. he, he was awesome. And when he found out I left, he was like, I always knew you were going to leave. There was no way you were going to keep doing that. That was so not you. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, you're right. <laughs> Um, but anyway, and look at that. You were able to have a friend with a member of the opposite sex. Yeah. Isn't that. that crazy? Yeah. Um, crazy. it's almost, it's almost like it's not always going to result in us just fucking, you know? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, I, I had that job, but I did regular pioneer that whole time. And then, um, eventually, like I said, I moved to Florida. And when I moved to Florida, the whole point was that I, A, I wanted to move to Florida because it'd be more fun, but the girl I moved in with, um, she was about 10 or 15 years older than me. So I was just 17, 18. And she was like early, late twenties, early thirties. Um, and so, uh, I moved in with her and she agreed to only charge me like $200 a month in rent so that I could afford a pioneer. Um, so I actually got a job, her family owned a, uh, auto body shop in that area. It was very successful. And so I got a job working for them as like a receptionist part-time and they made sure, like, I think they paid me a bit above minimum wage to make sure I was being supported as I, so I could keep pioneering and like, cause they were, it was a witness family. So my, my second job ever, which I was only at that bakery for like a year, but, um, my second job ever was witness owned. My job after that was witness owned also. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, I started working for them. They intentionally set everything up so I could keep pioneering. Um, I was in that congregation for back the same time, my, my childhood congregation in Florida. Um, and, uh, I was working for them for a while. And then I met these two girls who had come to that congregation who, um, again, became my best friends. They went through Kylie and Jade. They were sisters um, and their mom. And they lived literally across the street from this house I lived in with the sister. So like just walk a hundred feet across the, the middle of the street and I was at their front door. Um, they eventually gave me a key and everything. Like I just come and go. We basically said, joked that the street was our hallway um, and so, uh, they were regular pioneers also. So the three of us became thick as thieves. They, we all had Disney passes. So we'd go to Disney every weekend together. Um, and then they eventually joined a sign language congregation in the area. Go where the need is great. And, um, I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't like that very much. Um, I was never interested in sign language, but we all really wanted to travel. So we do like day trips and stuff a lot, but we eventually all went to South Korea together. And I, we just all were interested in it. Like I said, we were all in like K-pop and stuff at the time. You went just as a, like a vacation? Yeah. Yes, ish. So we actually went right around the memorial. So we went to the memorial in South Korea at an English congregation there, which was really interesting. Um, it was pretty cool. Um, I'm not going to lie. And so oh, yeah. I, mean, I will say, I, I know, different. I know at the core of things, like 
it's bad. I'm not there. It's a cult. I get it. But it's really cool to go across the globe and everybody just be like, oh my God, like we're such good friends because we're all the same religion. And I'm like, all right, this is, this is nice. Not that you can't be friends with people who are that religion, but it was pretty cool to come to this congregation. Everybody just immediately like welcome you. And like, it feels like their family at the time. Um, and so that was kind of cool. But, uh, we also, there was like a couple of South Korean brothers who had gotten out of prison. Um, and I'm sure you were aware of like all of that went in South Korea to where like the man mandated military, military service. Military service. Yeah. 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 So they just gotten out of prison for their time for not doing military service. And they'd done like a trip across America to meet a bunch of people who had sent them letters and corresponded with them while they were in prison. So we, they came to Florida and we met them and got to bring them to Disney um, for a day and hung out with them. And that, that's what kind of got us interested in going to Korea. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, oh, no, that's, that's actually a, that's, a, you know, again, it does show there are good times to be had, mm -hmm. even in a cult. It doesn't yeah. mean that the cult is good, uh, but there can still be good times because we're all just human beings. Yeah. And, and yeah. humans want to have a good time where, you know, and you see that a lot with Jehovah's Witnesses that they, they, they want they want to do things there's something stopping them mm -hmm. yeah so so we met them we and then when we went to south korea ourselves we met up with them they were actually in bethel the south korean bethel so they brought us there and gave us a tour of that and brought us out in the town and we had dinner with them and um that was a lot of fun um but all of that to say like when we went to south korea uh, I had been learning south or korean for that trip and i had gotten pretty good at it actually and so when we came back to Florida after the trip, I said, I want to move to South Korea and help that English congregation. Because while we were there, the English congregation was telling us um, how much of a need that they had um, for more Eng native English speakers. Because the South Korean Eng English speakers were not great. <laughs> um, so I came back from that trip and said, this is what I want to do. I want to move to South Korea. I want to help where the need is greater and also be in a freaking cool area because I loved it. It is by far my favorite place I've ever been. We went to Seoul specifically. Um, and so when we came back from that trip, I started uh, going on and off to the, there was a Korean congregation about like 30 minutes from where I lived in Florida. And so I started going there on and off. And then um, I started planning my move to South Korea. And at that time, I was about 19-ish years old. Um, and so my mom and dad were super supportive and that's when we planned another trip to South Korea and went with, with my mom so she could see where I wanted to be moving to and meet some of the people in the congregation. And that was an awesome time. Um, and so then I started trying to like, say like, how am I going to make money for this? How am I going to afford to make this move? Um, and so at the time I had moved from the auto body shop to work for a brother who owned a makeup company. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he owned, he and his wife owned a makeup company. And that's an so, interesting company for a witness to own. I don't know. There's just something about that that's yeah. Striking. So I worked for them as the uh, director of marketing. So I actually see. Okay, here's the thing. That sounds very high and important, but maybe like ten people work there. So hey, sure, yeah, yeah. So I I was only I'm the CEO them. of the Shun Podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. Um, so I used to, they did makeup shows all over the nation and even like outside the country. I went to a makeup show with them in London once, which was awesome. But we do the trade shows because it was like professional grade makeup for like special effects and stuff. Um, and so I, we, we drive th these places because it was cheaper to do that than to pay to like fly our equipment and like our uh, setup, like our uh, stall, whatever you want to call it, out to these places. So we drive from Florida to LA or Vancouver or Toronto or New York or Chicago so we did that a lot and would go out there and, and sell. And um, it was a brother and his wife and they had a little girl who they'd usually bring with them, but the wife and daughter would fly out there and meet us there. Um, and then like a couple other girls from the congregation would come and help sell, sell the booth. Um, so I did that for a little while and I got really, I got really close with that, um, that brother. And he, he was, he's about... I'd say 20 years older than me. Um, but we became just really good friends and like, but he always pushed, he always pushed the envelope and I always just thought it was him being cool to where like, we would just go out us like for dinner and drinks or like to lunch or just be us at the office working. And so I was always just like, oh, it's fine. Like whatever, we're tight. 
Um, and then when I, well, we'll circle back to him later, but like, I was really good friends with him and he actually helped pay for me and my mom to go to South Korea. Cause he thought this was a really cool goal of mine. Um, but he bought me shit all the time too. Like he bought me an Apple watch cause he said I needed it for work and an iPad cause I needed it for work. Um, and would like, just give me like money to go do things. And I was like, man, this is an awesome boss. Ignorant witness me. Great times. Yeah. Um, but we'll circle back to that. Um, so anyways, uh, did all this Korean stuff, moved to Tennessee. Actually, I moved in with my parents because my parents said, hey, if you want to go to Korea, support it. Move in with us. We won't charge you rent so you can save up money. And dad will get you a job at the mortgage company he works at um, so that you can save up for your trip to Korea. You'll just work there for a year, put every cent in savings. We'll pay for all of your stuff otherwise. And then you can go. And I was like, sounds freaking awesome. This is a sweet setup. So I mean, uh, really, for a Jehovah's Witness sister, especially, uh, because sisters don't have a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. and a lot of options in the congregation, for you to have to be staring down this as an opportunity, that's a pretty big deal. It was awesome. And everybody I knew was really excited for me. And I mean, like I said, me and those two girls, we traveled all the time. Neither of us, none of us were really super interested in dating. Like, we talked to, at that point, as soon as I turned 18, it was like this feeling. I woke up and I was like, I can talk to boys now. <laughs> but then nothing happened. I never met anybody. I never like ended up dating anybody. I did at one point secretly low-key date like this guy who worked at the auto body shop I was at who was worldly. Um, like we would just text and like we met up like twice for dates. And then I was like, eh, this is not great. And I'm trying to go to Korea and I need to be a better sister. And so... I definitely had ups and downs in, in Florida. There were times I was really strong and like studying all the time and like service all the time, doing great answers, whatever. And then there were times where I was just like not here for it. And I wouldn't be studying regularly. I'd miss a bunch of meetings, like whatever. And I remember at one point my brother called me and was like, hey, we're worried about you. Like we, we know you're missing meetings. Like some of the, like this family told us that we're friends with and we're just worried. And so that was like a kick in the ass for me. And I was like, oh man, I need to hunker down and get better. And then that was when we did the Korea trip. And so I was all high on, on everything, on witness life. Um, so I, that's the only like really relationship I had. Like the, the sister I live with, she had a brother who was my age, who I like, we were kind of interested in each other, but never really dated. Um, he's married to somebody else now. I don't know. But um, yeah, so I, we were pretty like just into traveling into the ministry and into going where the need was greater. And we thought that was like the coolest life. Um, and even when I was doing the makeup trip stuff, like even then I was getting to see like a bunch of the country and go to these big cities and um, do that kind of thing. So like, I loved my life. I had, a, I thought it was awesome. And I was like getting to see all this stuff and travel. I was single. I had I didn't have a ton of money, but I had enough money to do all this stuff and not really worry about it. I had family I could fall back on. Um, and then also we met this other set of sisters in Florida, like right before I moved um, named Jasmine and Tatum, who they were like really into traveling and um, became kind of tight with them, kept in touch with them. And so we just had a really great, like tight friend group. And then I moved to Tennessee to pursue this and kind of, I kept in touch with those friends, but I kind of left that part of things behind to kind of like hunker down and take things seriously for a little bit so that I could reach these goals that we had. Wow, I don't I mean, know what you asked me. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember how, how we started, but I know where we I are I told now. you, I can get away from it. I can let things get away from me. I just <laughs> talk. <okay. laughs> so, um, well, but I mean, that takes you up to this point in your life. I mean, this is a, again, I, I think that, uh, I guess a, through line of your story is you are having a lot of good times around mm -hmm. this and you are meeting people and it's stimulating and you're you know the, having you and one sister living in a house and or whatever and two sisters basically across the street and you all becoming thick as thieves um it is there are those relationships and and it can be fun you had it sounds like you were having fun with all of this uh not so much fun that it kept you at all the meetings all the time <laughs> <laughs> uh, but everybody goes through those periods and 
I used to make excuses and go with my friends to their sign language meeting. I didn't speak any sign language. It was just dead silent and they were doing things. I don't know what was going on. And I would just sit there and be like, this is great. And just be on my phone and be like, man, I get to say I went to a meeting and where the need was greater and not have to pay any attention or do anything. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, wow. Hey, maybe a, a way out for some people. <laughs> Wait, this life hack, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Allow me to break in here for a second. This channel is made possible by you, the listener. If you appreciate what we're doing here, please consider supporting at patreon.com slash shunned or leave a review on iTunes or other platforms, uh, like and subscribe. All those things help the channel. If you're looking for merch, you can go get some shun swag from the shunpodcast.com website or reach out there to be on the show. If you're looking for more ex Jehovah's Witness content, I'll recommend my first podcast called This JW Life. You can find that on podcast apps as well as YouTube. And if you're feeling stuck in life, struggling to find happiness and community, maybe you're haunted by the past, beating yourself up, unsure of who you are or what you even want out of life now that you've lost this one identity that was given to you by a cult, reach out through my other sites like xjwhelp.com, that's exjwhelp.com, or storyworkscoaching.com. And let's see about working together to help you find a life that fits you and who you are, maybe for the first time ever. And now, back to our guest. Um, so you now are back in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and I guess your next hunker down moment then is to just put your nose to the grindstone, so to speak, make some money. And then you can go. Mm -hmm. And how? And I, I also have to say, it's rather. Um, I don't know what term I want to use. I'm just going to say progressive or interesting. It's interesting that your Jehovah's Witness parents were permissive enough to allow you to move to Florida at such a young age, and now they're all about you going to Korea. Mm -hmm. obviously it's all in the name of Jehovah, so to speak. Right. But uh, still, I think there's a lot of parents that would not allow that. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I think I was very lucky with that, but this is again, your parents being loose in quotes in the congregation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I had at that point, by the time I was uh, at that age, I guess, technically an adult, I had a really healthy relationship with them and a lot of trust yeah. um, between us all that I had uh, learned to gain by lying a lot. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, gosh, that's something I joke about with my husband that I'm sure he doesn't like. Is I'm like, yeah, I'm actually a really good liar. <laughs> uh, just so you, you know. You have to I mean, learn to be a good liar when you're growing up and as a witness, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, most Joe extra as witnesses are good liars yeah. because – uh, mm -hmm. we were put in such unreasonable circumstances that it forced mm -hmm. us to lie. Yeah. So I was, I had gained a lot of trust and res mutual respect with my parents. And, um, I, I, as every witness is told, every, every witness kid is told you're so mature for your age. Um, and so they thought I was really mature for my age. I was really trustworthy. There were lots of mutual respect. So, I mean, to them, like I was good to go and I had clearly shown I was strong in the truth. So what they have to worry about, you know? Yeah. But let me tell you, I have a lot to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what have so over that year, do you just put your nose down and put your head down and do your thing so that you can get to South Korea? Well, spoiler alert, I never went back to South Korea. Ah, okay. So um I started, I got a job at my dad's company, um, a mortgage company, and I got a entry-level job in collections. Um, which this company, my brother and sister-in-law, when they did get married, they both stayed in this area. So they're both still in this area. Um, and my brother had gotten a job at this company also. And so did my sister-in-law. And they both started in the mail room, which was a level, I think, four or five. And then I started in collections, which was like a level seven. And I used to love rubbing it in their face that I got to start at a higher entry level than them. I just love pulling one over on my brother all the time. What can I say? A little sibling rivalry. Yeah. My brother and I hated each other growing up. There was no love between us. But as soon as I started uh, chaperoning for them and, you know, let them get away with shit, um, 
but even before, like, even besides that part of it, that was when we started to really like build a bond with each other and like share things with each other. And, um, by the time I left, my brother and I were very, very close. Um, so like in adulthood, we, we really became close, but, um, so they all worked there and I started in collections and I got hired to this team and there was a guy on this team. Spoiler alert again, I'm married to him now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, he was, his name is Zach. And, um, I met him and I, I mean, I met a lot of people on this team. It was again, my first time in years being around worldly people because the last time I had been for any period of time was that job I had when I was 16 at a, at the cafe for a year. Um, and then ever since then I'd worked with just witnesses really and been a witness and out of school, obviously, and no college. So like witness world, that's it. Um, and you know, like I definitely had a perception that everybody here is bad. They're all see, like doing bad things. Every, like they're not good people. They're they're worldly, um, and so I was shocked and surprised, pleasantly surprised to learn that they were really good people. Um, and so I just started to make friends and like have a good time at work with these people and kind of go to lunch with them every now and then. Um, and then at work at this place that we worked, they were very big on like engagement events. Um, at, like you like outside of work hours as well as during work hours. And so um, like we would have, uh, like our team was number one in the company a a bunch of times. And so as a reward, we'd be given like uh, an engagement event of our choice. So like I went boating with my team once um, out on a lake or we went to Dollywood, a theme park here, or we, um, they had a lot of um, what they call like casino nights where um, if you qualified for it, you got to go to like this in-house casino thing and wear like a formal dress and like, just have a good time and win stuff and um, like that kind of thing, which I was allowed to go to. I talked to my parents. I was like, should I go to this? It's gambling. And they were like, mm, it's not real gambling because you're not using real money, which we were. It was like all fake money. And so I was allowed to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I was thinking on that one. I don't That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, so like I just became very like immersed in this world and like made these friends. And again, like I started hanging out with this one girl named Katie, like outside of work. And then um, my manager, like I thought she was really cool and we go to lunch sometimes. And then, um, and then Zach and Zach and I exchanged phone numbers and just started like talking a lot. We both love to travel. And so I would talk about South Korea. He spent a lot of time in Thailand. Um, he has some crazy stories, let me tell you. Um, but we just started chatting and like, I told him up front, I was like, Hey, like, a, I'm trying to go to South Korea. I'm here to work for a couple, like a year, and then I'm I'm out, um, and I'm a witness, and kind of explain to him what that entailed and everything. Um, but we just kind of like were flirty and whatever, and um, I started to like go hang out with him outside of work, and then at the same time that this was happening, um, my friend I told you about in Florida, the the two girls we met later, so not like Kylie and Jade, but these other girls. It was her names are Jasmine and Tatum, but mostly Jasmine was the one I was close with. Um, I was still keeping in touch with her, and at the same time, I was kind of falling for Zach. I was telling her about it, and we, I trusted her more than any of my friends, even though I knew her the least amount of time because she was very similar to me in that she also was kind of like the black sheep, and we would have very open, frank conversations about like whether or not we wanted to stay in the truth or what was the truth then. Sorry, it just mm-hmm. rolls off the tongue sometimes. Oh, of course. Um, and so like we both were kind of had moments we were kind of on the fence and be like honest with each other about it. And she, I told her about Zach and then she told me about a guy that she had started dating who was worldly. And so we were both kind of keeping each other updated with the progressions of our relationships. Um, meanwhile, keeping it secret, I was still living at home with my parents. And so I'd go to Zach's house like after meeting sometimes and just tell my parents that I was out driving around listening to music, which they believed <laughs> till like 1 a.m. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> you really um, like music. You were taught, you were brought up to appreciate exactly, music. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and again, there was that trust and respect and I was just a good liar. And so they believed me. And so I would not be home a lot of evenings and just tell them I was out on the phone with my friend, just driving around talking to them or listening to music, or I went to a restaurant or whatever. And they always believed me. Um, but there were also other times where I would be home at night and Zach would be like, Hey, you should come over. Like, let's like watch a movie. And I'd want to, but I couldn't, I couldn't think of a way to get out of the house. That they wouldn't hear me and be like, why should we be in the house at midnight? Like, what am I going to tell them? 
Um, so I'd have to tell Zach no. And that was actually a big thing, like in our relationship to where there was like a point where he about like three, four months in, he was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Cause I feel like I'm dating like a high schooler. And I was like, Oh, so that kind of, that hurt. And I was like, Oh fuck, I need to figure this out and like decide what I'm going to do. And so I was like, I trying to decide I was going to break up with him. And then Jasmine called me at one point when I'm house sitting for another witness and she's crying and she tells me that she's slept with her boyfriend and that she needs to go to the elders. And so I was like, okay, this is going to be crazy. So she goes to the elders and they of course do their thing and they don't disfellowship her because she gets engaged to this guy. And the elder tells her that because they're engaged, that is sacred and they cannot punish her for that. And she's clearly taking this relationship seriously. She seems repentful, but she is going to marry him and like close the deal, so to speak. So they privately reprove her. And I remember telling my dad about it. And my dad called this elder because my dad was like, that makes no sense. Like, she's clearly not repentful because she's marrying the guy. He's still worldly. Like, how could they just privately reprove her? Like, she fucked up. And my dad calls this elder and this, I don't know what their conversation was, but I just know that elder reached out to me later and was like, this was private information. Why would you share this with your dad? And I was like, well, he's an elder too. So I kind of figured like elders, it's all the same. And Jasmine shared it with me. So it's not like I like listened in, like this information was openly shared with me. And I just discussed it with somebody who's supposed to be like an elder in the congregation, like whatever. Pretty wild to me that your dad would call that other el- elder. Yeah. Like, I, I was actually wow, really surprised he did too, but <laughs> um so like I was just really torn up the whole time because it took a while for them to decide they were just gonna privately reprove her but like this whole time she's like really into this guy they'd only been together for six months and they were now engaged and uh again spoiler alert to this day they are married and have a baby oh. um and so they they get together they they decide to do do the whole thing I remember they get married but when they were planning their wedding um during that time, I was still dating Zach and I was helping her kind of plan the wedding um, because they were just doing like a quick elopement thing. And so I was like helping her plan long distance and figure everything out. She was really stressed because she was still waiting to hear back from the elders. Um, And so I remember one night I like stayed over at Zach's house, like overnight, which, and we didn't do anything, but I just like, we stayed up the whole night just talking. And I remember being like, I, I didn't come home. Like, what are my parents going to do? Like, what are they going to think? And so, um, I, my dad called me at like 6am and was like, where are you? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm at Waffle House. I've been at Waffle House all night on the phone with Jasmine, helping her plan her wedding. She's just really stressed. It's in two days. Like, I'm so sorry. I didn't let you guys know. And then I remember I got off the phone with him and he was pissed, but he believed me. And uh, I looked at Zach and I was like, we have to go to Waffle House right now. He's like, why? I'm like, because I just told my dad I was there. And he was like, is he going to come there? And I was like, no. And he's like, then why do you need to go? I'm like, because I feel like I need to make this be true. And I just felt so guilty about it. I don't know what that was about mentally for me, but like I had to make it be true. And so like I went to Waffle House with him and made him have breakfast with me there. <laughs> um, I just think. I have to make this be true. Isn't that so much of what it is to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses? You just saying that it's, I see this thing that doesn't add up, but I have to make it be true Mm -hmm. because I've invested so much into this. And because the penalties are so high, I have to make this be true. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, you know, and, and then taking that to a macro level, just you with the Waffle House. Now you have to make this be true. It has to be, mm-hmm. or else what? <laughs> or else the guilt eats you alive. You yeah. feel like your life can't go on because it's not in line with God's will. Something yeah. like that. I don't know. I thought I, I just, was definitely going to die in Armageddon, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> But I have to make this be true, I think, is um, I think there's a lot of people that if they were honest with themselves inside the organization, they would realize that they are trying to make it true rather than it being true. 
I agree. Yeah. So went to also, did you go to Waffle House? We did. We went to Waffle House. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> which that's, again, that's something Zach and I now laugh about. We look back on. Um, but yeah. So, so anyways, what I'm trying to get to here, though, is the fact that eventually I did sleep with Zach. Um, felt awful, awful guilt for it. And I called Jasmine and I was like, she'll understand. She did the same thing. She's literally same boat as me. Like a, she was maybe like a month ahead of me in timeline with everything. And so I call her, I spill my entire heart to her, tell her everything that happened. I need to go to the elders. I'm not sure yet if I'm going to say I'm repentant. And we finished this phone call. She's like loosely supportive, but kind of noncommittal. It was weird. The way she was acting was weird. And I just remember thinking that like, this wasn't what I expected her reaction to be. She wasn't upset, but she wasn't supportive like I expected. And so I got off the phone with her and was just thinking about what I was going to do. And I remember she called me like two days later and she was like, hey, I'm sorry, I have to admit this to you. And I was like, what's going on? And she said, remember that day you called me and told me everything that was happening? Yeah. Well, Kylie and Jade were in the car with me and I just didn't tell you when you were on speakerphone. Oh, that is rough. Yeah, I, to this day, like, I'm shocked she did that. Like, I, that was not anything I ever would have expected from her, especially considering me, how I, like, helped support her when she did the exact same freaking thing. Yeah, yeah, but she did the same thing and felt shame about it. She's not a witness anymore. She's inactive. Okay, but is she, well, I mean, I don't, we don't have to discuss all the particulars, but um, yeah, but yeah, a lot of people do feel bad about things or feel some shame. So they feel, and it, it, it's interesting, the hypocrisy of many people in this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, wow, this is really bad boundaries and quite two-faced. <laughs> yep. So I blocked wow. her as soon as she told me. And never spoke to her again after she told me that and admitted it. Um, which I think she, I, I think she had to have understood that. Um, and so then like a couple days later, so my, in the background, meanwhile, while this was happening, my brother and sister-in-law um, literally threw a dart at a map and said, we're going to move to uh, somewhere in Idaho. I don't even remember where it was now. Um, cause it's a remote area and there was a need in the congregation there <clears throat> went out there beautiful. So they were moving out there in November of 2018 or no, they moved out there like September, October, 2018. Um, and all of this with Zach was going down in like October of 2018, um, was when everything came to a head. And, um, my parents went out in November to visit them and asked me if I would come with them. And I said yes, but I was going to come out like a couple of days after them and fly out there um, because I had decided I was going to tell one of the elders what happened while they were gone. Um, so, and I had decided as well that although I was kind of bought into everything, I was pretty over it. Like I just didn't feel invested anymore. And I believed it was the truth still at the time, but I just knew I didn't want to be a witness right now. Like, I felt like I had things I wanted to do in the world. Um, obviously, I was now in love with this guy. And um, I was pretty hurt by, like, my friends who I thought were good people and witnesses. Um, and so I just kind of was like, this is my out. And I decided that I was going to tell the elders and that no matter what they asked, I was just going to keep insisting I wasn't repentant because I wanted to be disfellowshipped. I wanted to cut ties because I knew based on how strict my parents were and still committed, my parents were always of the opinion that like, if you were doing things that were bad enough that you should be disfellowship, that you just never met to get disfellowship, you should still excommunicate that person. So I knew- yeah, Your dad kind of seemed excited to get Jasmine disfellowshipped. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, so I knew I wanted to be disfellowship because I wanted to cut ties because I knew either way they were going to 
cut me off. But at least this way, they couldn't try and bring me. Well, they couldn't. I knew that if I did not disfellowship myself, they would just try and constantly reach out to me and push me and try and pull me back and preach to me, basically. And I didn't want to deal with that. And I just decided I was going to cut ties and that that was going to be the best way to do this. And if I ever wanted to come back, I would come back and it'd be fine. Um, and so that's what I did. I told the elders what happened. They, of course, said, all right, we're going to set up a judiciary meeting. I hadn't told anybody else what was happening except for Jasmine and them. And so um, I decided that when I went up to Idaho, I was going to tell everybody. So I went to Idaho. I told Zach, I was like, hey, this is what's about to happen. I'm about to tell my family they're not going to talk to me again. And he was like, okay. <laughs> he didn't believe me at all. He thought I was just being dramatic. Yeah, because it's and, insane and it's yes. hard for your average <laughs> like, person to later, understand. Later, he was like, I just didn't think anybody would actually do that. And I was like, I tried to tell you. And he was like, you do have to understand that everybody else does not think that's a real thing. Um, so he he didn't really believe me. And so um, I was like, all right, bye. I went across the country and um, I got to Idaho. I had to kind of act like everything was fine. But in the background, I knew it wasn't. And apparently it showed because my sister-in-law like asked me to go on a walk with her and walk her dog. We were walking and she was like, dude, like what's going on? Like clearly you're not okay. Like what's happening? And also in between now in that time, I'd gotten texts from not Jade, Jade, I never talked to you again, but Kylie had sent me this huge long text about how much of a bitch I was and that I was fake the entire time they were friends. I never cared about them. I was always a bad person at heart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was very awful. Um, and you see who they are. Yeah. And, uh, I went on a walk with Alexa. I broke down. I told her everything and what I was about to tell everybody. <clears throat> I did not tell her that I intended to get disfellowship. I never told anybody that. So at that point, you actually hadn't had a judicial committee. No, I just okay. knew that one was scheduled. Um, okay. It was scheduled for the Sunday after I was getting back. So okay, like so you were just going to reveal to everyone that you were going to have a judicial yes. committee. Okay. Yes. Um. So I broke down, told her everything. Um, she was obviously very sad. Like her sister had actually been disfellowshipped when Evan and Alexa started dating at the time. Um, and she has since been reinstated. But at the time she was still disfellowshipped. And my parents never liked how her family handled it because she was an adult, but she actually like moved back in with them for a time because she was having financial difficulties. And my parents always thought that was very wrong of them to do. Um, to let her Better to let him live on the street. Yeah, she's an adult. She should figure it out. She left Jehovah. That's her fault. Yep. Um, so she was uh, very sympathetic and like very sad. And um, I showed her like the text from Kylie and she was pissed. She was like, if you get disfellowship, I'm literally going to call Kylie and like destroy her for saying this shit to you. And I was like, yeah, I hope she did. I don't know if she ever did, but I hope so. <laughs> I like to imagine she did. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so I told her everything and she was like, all right, well, thanks for telling me ahead of time. Like, if you need any help or support while we talk to your family, like, let me know. And I was like, no, I think good. I got this. And so then she told my brother. And so, um, I remember talking to him to like, we went to dinner at a restaurant he knew about it. And it was clear because he has an even worse poker face than I do. I have this picture of us at dinner that night. It's the last picture I have with my family and everybody's sitting around this table. I have a very forced smile. Alexa has a very forced smile. My parents look thrilled and my brother's just sitting there like this in this picture. And it cracks me up to look at because he, he is such a bad poker face. Um, you could tell he was just not happy that night. But uh, anyways, so he knew what was about to happen and we all get back from dinner. And so I tell them all like, hey, this is what's been going on. This is who it's with. Um, I want to date him. And I'm probably about to get this fellowship. I'm going to be meeting with the judicial committee. I told this brother in the congregation about it. I'll be meeting with them next weekend. And my dad just didn't say anything. He just got up and walked away. And then my mom was crying. But like, 
I think she was very like trying to reassure herself. She was like, okay, well, it's okay. Like you can come back. Like maybe they won't disfellowship you. And I was like, yeah, maybe they won't. Like, and I, I lied because I didn't want them to know that like I was just going to be gone. So I was like, yeah, like even if I am disfellowship, I'll definitely try and come back. Um, and like, you know, gave them all the reassurance I could and that I just wanted to see where this relationship went though. That that's all it was about. And so my mom was like, okay. And then my dad just didn't talk to me the rest of the trip. And then I got home. So we get home and I'm just trying to like kind of avoid my parents and don't really want to talk more about it. Cause it's just not a fun conversation. Um, and then one day they're like, Hey, we want to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So it was like a, like a day or two before the meet, the judicial meeting. And they're like, all right, so we've talked and here's what we think. Um, if you are disfellowshipped, you can continue to live with us, but um, you will have to follow these rules. And they give me like this huge list. I'm going to have to, I'm at this point, I'm 20 years old. I'm going to have to start giving my phone back to them. I can't go anywhere without telling them where I'm going I have to go to all the meetings. I have like this huge, huge list Are you about still how. See Zach? Oh no, no! If I, I'm Ed, Zach is done. That's not an option. Um, mm-hmm. And they're like, so this is what you're gonna have to do if you're disfellowshipped. Alternatively, if you're approved, you're still gonna have to do these things, but you're also gonna have to like go into field service and like you know do be active in your congregation because you'll be allowed to be. Um, and like in my head, I'm like, yeah, right. Like I'm going to do any of this. Um, but I was like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, you know, be agreeable. What else are you supposed to do? Play, play the role that you have to play to yep. survive. And so um, then again, like I'm still meeting, like I'm still working with Zach. I'm still working every day. So like, I'm still seeing him um, whether they know it or not. Um and so I told Zach, like, kind of what was going on. Again, he was still like, I mean, oh, okay, like, big whoop, like, you're an adult, do what you want. And I'm like, like, again, looking back, it's crazy to me, like, that moment when he was like, I feel like I'm dating a teenager. It's just crazy to me to look back at when I was a legitimate adult and still felt so, like, restricted as to what I could freely do. Um, so that's, like, still weird to to think about. But um he was like, all right, yeah, I mean, whatever, sure, that's going to happen. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> I uh, told him, I was like, hey, like, as soon as this happens, I'm going to need to move out. Like, I, I can't stay at home. Like, this is what they just told me, and I'm not going to do it, so they're not going to let me live with them. So I need to have, I need to be ready. Um, so he was like, all right, like, I guess you got to find a place, which at this point, by the way, we've been dating for about six months or maybe a little less. No, we, I started working there in April of 2018. We started dating in September of 2018 and I was disfellowshipped like the first week of December, 2018. So it all happened pretty quick, actually. Yeah, that is pretty quick. Uh, looking back, but um, Eight months. we've only been together like three-ish months. Um, and so I now looking back, I shouldn't be surprised, but he didn't offer for me to like live with him temporarily. And I remember being really offended about that. Um, but honestly, three months into relationship, I wouldn't want to live with somebody either. Uh, (laughs) So, um, but he was like, yeah, you're going to need to, um, to move out, like find a place, like here's some places, like kind of gave me a list of some cheap places. I couldn't afford any of them. And so he was like, well, you're going to need a roommate then. And I was like, okay, still nothing. He was like, yeah, you should look on Craigslist. (laughs) This boy, I can't believe I'm I'm kidding. I love him. But, um. He was a lot back then. And, well, and now, he's just expecting you to yeah. be a typical adult mm-hmm. who would just go, okay, so you can't live here. Just go work it out. That's mm-hmm. what you do, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, he, he wasn't expecting all of this. Yes, um, for sure. And so like, even now he like feels bad about it, but I'm like, whatever, like it actually all worked out great. So I found this, I found this girl on Craigslist. Um, her name's Allie. And, uh, we went and met, she texted, I texted her and just told her I was looking for a roommate and she's like, okay, cool. Let's meet at Starbucks. And like the day of, she was like, Hey, actually, do you want to meet at like casual pint and get a beer? Um, which at that point I was actually 21. I turned 21 in October, um, of 2018. So I was like, hell yeah, let's do that. And so we went to casual pint. Zach actually beat me there. I asked Zach to come when we met her. 
Um, and he beat me there. And so they met first and were chatting and then I got there and we just all hit it off. Um, and that night I went to, her, she owned a house already. And so she was looking for somebody to rent a room at her house. Um, and so I went to her house with Zach and she had this amazing dog <laughs> and the house was super cute. And, um, I was like, yeah, sold, let's do it. Um, so I signed a, a lease with her and then this was all, I think I met her like the day before my judici judiciary meeting. Um, and so I finally go to this meeting. I feel good because I, I have everything lined up for myself after this. I have a place. I have a boyfriend. I have a couple friends. Like, it's not going to be too bad. Get in this meeting, and it's exactly what you'd expect. All right, so how many times did you guys meet? How long has this been going on? Do you plan to continue this? Uh, all of that. They didn't go too deep into it, which I was actually kind of expecting. I thought. Oh, I they didn't really... go into, like, the pervy sexual questions? Yes, which I was expecting. I was totally yeah. prepared for that. And, of course, I'm still thinking it's normal. Like, sure. I'm just thinking this is normal process, whatever. I don't care what they ask me. I'm just going to tell them. Again, I'm an open book kind of person anyways. Um, sure. Always have been. And so... Um, I just answer all their questions and they're like, all right, so you're going to keep seeing him. Yep. Do you like, are you repentant? Like, do you have it? And I was like, no, I don't feel bad about it, which inside I felt awful. Like I felt so bad about it, but I just knew this is what I needed to say to cut the tie. Um, and so uh, I, I told them I felt bad about it or did not feel bad about it. And they're like, all right. I mean, the meeting lasted 10, 15 minutes. It was not long. And they said, all right, like, we're going to talk out there and Go out there five minutes later, they call me in and they're like, Yeah, we're gonna disfellowship you. And I was like, Whoa, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was like, All right. And um, throughout all of this, by the way, I forgot I should circle back to this. Um, after the Jasmine thing happened, I called um, that brother I worked for at the makeup company who I was close with. Um, I'll call him P. That's an awful name. I shouldn't go with that initial. I'll call him E. Um, okay last name okay um, so I've been in contact with E the whole time and like letting him know what was going on and I told him I was about to be disfellowshipped because he actually had um, some family who's disfellowshipped also and he very surprisingly was like hey I don't want to lose touch with you and I was like all right cool like this guy's cool again like he's always the cool guy um so I was like yeah that's great and I actually still had furniture down in Florida with my old roommate and so he was like hey I'll come up and drive your furniture up there since you're moving out of your parents house and we'll need furniture and I was like great so they decided we just fellowshipped I go home I tell my family um that I'm being disfellowshipped and they both just lose it like emotionally and they just start crying and my mom did get very angry um this was the last time I talked to her she was just sobbing and just yelled at me. I can't believe you're choosing this random guy over Jehovah. And then like went in her bedroom and slammed the door. And that was the last time I ever talked to her. So that's the last thing I heard from my mom. So that's cool. Didn't she move? Didn't she marry a worldly guy? Yeah, but she wasn't a witness yet. Oh, that's right. She wasn't. That, that's right. She wasn't. Um, she was but Catholic. Still, the, so everything she know that worldly fine. guys can be okay, right? <sighs> Apparently not. Yeah. Um, so that's what she told me. My dad just cried and he hugged me and he said, I'm going to miss having conversations with you. And that was the last time I talked to him. And that's what he told me. And well, I mean, we obviously before that part, I did tell him that I had a place lined up and that I was moving out and that I would not be doing their, their 10 step program. <laughs> Yeah. And it's really unfortunate when something like this happens, people's emotions get really big and they will often act out or, you know, be really hateful and nasty. Even doesn't sound like your dad really was. That's actually kind of a nice he, thing to say, though. I mean, still, you don't have to shun your kid. Yeah. So <clears throat> um, I guess I, I, I say it's the last thing my mom said to me, but she did text me at one, one more time before I left to where she texted me to let me know when she was going to be in field service. So I could make sure we moved out by the time she got back. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got to go right. spread the love. while oh, you. Oh back. yeah. So <laughs> much love. Yes. yes. Um, so uh, I finished that. I, packed up all my stuff. I was going to be announced at a meeting like a week and a half later. And I planned to be at that meeting. 
Um, I planned that to be my last meeting, but I wanted to be there. I wanted to like show that I wasn't like, I don't know. I felt like it was cowardly to not go in some way to not like show my face and be like, yeah, that's right. (laughs) Hey, sure. Um, so I wanted to be there for it. Um, and so, uh, I was also in the, I guess this is kind of like gross of me, but like, I wanted to see everybody's reaction kind of like, I was always the good kid. Like, even though I was the black sheep of my family, I was the good kid. I came from the good family. Like growing up, I remember, gosh, there was this statistic and I don't remember what it was, but I remember I used to hear it in the congregations that like 60% of kids you grow up with in, in the truth end up leaving or something like that. That's a lot. Yeah. I remember it being a pretty high number and I remember being a bad, I told you I'm a bitch of a witness kid. So I remember like talking about who I thought were going to be the ones to leave. (laughs) Um, Of course it was never me. Oh, of course Um, not. Yeah. And so uh, I remember talking about that. And so I remember like, I just knew it was gonna be shocking to everybody that I was one leaving. Like I was currently living with my parents to save up money to go help where the need was greater. I was a regular pioneer. Like, it was, it was going to be a shock. And I knew that. And, um, so I wanted to be there for it. And so I packed up my, everything that would fit in my car at the time and left my parents' house, went to my new house, um, unpacked all my stuff, moved in there. Um, I did still need my furniture and here comes E. He drove up like a couple days later. Again, it was right before my meeting was going to be in where I was announced. Um, and he came up there dropped off all of my furniture and everything. And he had gotten like an Airbnb nearby that he was staying at. And I was excited for him to be there. And I was like, Hey, you got to meet Zach. Um, so he's like, Oh, it sounds great. So we go out for Mexican food. So we're at this local Mexican restaurant and they meet. And I mean, it's, it's all right. Like it's not anything like, you know, stellar, but like they have good conversation, whatever. And when we got there, he'd already ordered drinks for everybody. So we got there and there's already mar- like three margaritas on the table. And he'd gotten me like the jumbo hugest margarita they had. And so um, I was sitting there, I'm like, cool, free drinks. Again, naive Elizabeth. And so we're just sitting there at this table, like chilling, have a good time. I'm now on my second jumbo margarita, also 21. So just old enough to drink and have no tolerance whatsoever. Um, we're all chilling and Zach's like, all right, well, he has a, he got a puppy like around this time. And so he's like, I got to go home and let the dog out. Um, so like, you're obviously not good to drive Elizabeth. Do you want me to give you a ride home first? And he was like, no, I can give her a ride home. Um, I Ubered here anyway. So like, I can just drive her car. I'm fine. And so Zach was like, all right, like, are you cool with that Elizabeth? And I was like, yeah, whatever. Drunk. It's great. Um, and so I, he was like, all right, sounds good. And so Zach left and he and I get in my car. I'm in the passenger seat. I remember we pull onto like this main road and I'm so sick. I'm hanging out the window, literally vomiting, <laughs> like on the side of the car. Like I was so drunk and felt so, so gross. And I was pretty out of it, like kind of going in and out. And I remember suddenly, like at some point, I felt like we'd been driving for a really long time. And I didn't really know where we were. And we were under like, I think we were under like an overpass or something. And he started touching me. And I remember not really knowing what to do. And I was super drunk and I, my eyes were closed. And so I thought maybe he thought I was passed out. And so I just sat there and waited and was like trying to figure out what to do and just pretend like I was still asleep. And then he stopped and I heard his pants on zip. And so at that point, I was like, all right, I have to pretend like I'm waking up. And so like, I just kind of like moan a little bit, like open my eyes. And if I believed in God still, I would think this was God. At that moment, Zach calls and my phone is connected Mm. through my car's Bluetooth. So my phone starts ringing at that moment. And I reach for and immediately just press the green button to answer it. And I'm like, hello. And like, pretend like I'm still super out of it. He's like, Hey, are you home? Like, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't think we're home yet. And he's like, yeah, we hit some traffic. We're still trying to get home. Um, you know, we'll be there soon. And I was like, Hey guys, I'm feeling really sick. Like I need to stop right now somewhere. And so he's like, but no, we're almost home. It's fine. Well, you'll be home in just a second. And Zach could pick it up. He was like, it's been like an hour and a half. You guys should be home now. And he is like, yeah, yeah, no, we're almost home. And he's like, why don't you pull over where you're at? Sounds like you're not good to drive, Eve. Like, why don't you just pull over? Like, are you by like a grocery store or something? And 
he's like, yeah, yeah. Like we're right by this Kroger. Like I'll send you a pin drop. You like come check us out, whatever. And so he pulls over at this Kroger. And so I'm like, I got to puke. I got to go inside. So I grab my phone, grab my purse, jump out of this car and run straight inside and just start sobbing. And I call Zach and I can barely talk. I'm telling him what happened. And he's like, oh my God, like go in the bathroom, lock the door. Do not come out. Like stay where you are. Like I'm on my way. I'm almost there. I'll call the cops, like whatever. And so I'm just like breaking down this bathroom. He gets there. He comes and gets me. He's like, where'd you park? And so um, I try and like kind of show him where we parked. <clears throat> And so I stay in the Kroger and Zach like walks outside to where I pointed to where the car was and goes to, to E. I don't know what he said to him. I just know he made him leave. He made him get out of the car. The cops got there. And by the time the cops got there, um, he was gone. We think he took like an Uber somewhere um, and, or called an Uber or something, but he was gone. I gave a police report and like described what happened and everything. And um, they were like, all right, like we'll see what we can do. And I never heard from him again. He tried to call me. He tried to email me. He tried to tell me that I misunderstood and nothing happened. And I was just really drunk. And Zach had to like call him and just ream him out and like tell him to leave me alone and that we filed a police report and that um, he also had reached out to his wife to tell him what had happened, which his wife didn't believe us. Of course. So um, I, after that, we blocked him and everything. I never heard him from him again, but I, the cops followed up with me. I was drunk and I was the only one in the car. So there's no proof that it happened. So I had to drop the charges, um, which they were like, I mean, we'll try and pursue this. If you have any proof that, you know, sure. he was going to do this or anything, but I didn't have anything to show for it. Um, so never really got to do anything with that. I never told anybody besides like any witness nobody knows my family doesn't know that happened like I guess his wife knows but she didn't believe it um never told anybody else and so like I'm sure he's still just a ministerial servant chilling in Florida at that congregation with his makeup company full of young girls that work for him and I'm sure this is not the first time or oh no I, I it's actually funny because because when this is all plotted there, out. This is somebody who's done this. Mm -hmm. When I first started there, his wife didn't like me and was like super cautious and told me that I reminded her of a girl that I never was told the details on. But I'm a thousand percent sure now that it's just the same thing that happened with me to where there was this girl who started who was really tight with and then started making up all these malicious lies about him and eventually was disfellowshipped and left the congregation. And she's crazy and an apostate and an awful person and looking back i'm like damn she was me like a couple years ago so uh, so all this happened the night before my announcement meeting to say i was disfellowshipped and i missed it i didn't go because i was traumatized in bed at home like crying every five seconds and trying to figure out what to do and if I needed to call my parents and tell them or like who to tell what to do with this. But I knew I was like, I was alone in a car with a guy. All of them are going to say, A, you shouldn't have put yourself in that situation. And B, there's not a witness. There's nobody to be able to back me up and say, yes, he sexually assaulted her. It's my word against and, him. And if there's and not the that, then. Fellowshipped, you know, like who are they going to believe? <laughs> right. And if that happens, if there's no proof, then you're not worthy of support mm -hmm. or love or compassion. Yep. So I, I just, I was like, I'm going to tell the cops because they're the people who I think could act, would actually do something about this. <laughs> Big joke on me there. But I knew the cops. Well, again, you got to, I mean, you know, I know people get upset about the two witness rule and I understand why they are upset by it. My upset is that they shouldn't be adjudicating it anyway. And that in the, in real court, I mean, you have to have some proof. Like he said, she said, uh, those things happen all the time and you can't just go by that. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish that, you know, wish we could all the time, but th then there would be other things too that would happen. The it's one really thing, unfortunate. The one thing I'm holding on to, or at least hopeful made maybe some sort of impact is that they did tell me that this report that's been filed like with his name and everything is in the system now yep. so i at least hope that if something were to happen in the future that would at least be some evidence that oh he's been reported for this before something like that i don't know how that works but maybe it will help in the future sure um so. you know I, I i hope so as well i think that you know again even jehovah's witnesses internally 
if something is reported, they supposedly take that report and then they're supposed to use if there are multiple reports that to establish a pattern uh, and then for their own judicial process. But we all know that that doesn't always ha doesn't often happen. Um, yeah. And they look for reasons to keep these people in. And you know, ultimately, nobody wants to believe, you know, even the guy's wife doesn't want to believe, you know, nobody wants to believe that your husband, your wife, whoever is this person, it's really hard to believe uh, for the people in their lives. But what's unfortunate is that then there's you and you're the person that really needs to be believed um, and supported. And, and I'm so sorry that happened to you. It's awful. And um, I mean, what a piece of shit. Just, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's lucky. He's very fortunate that Zach called the police or something and didn't just beat him into a coma out in a parking lot. You know, I mean, uh, well, you mess with the wrong person. <laughs> Things things get ugly, um, yeah. and so I, I that's just that's so horrendous. I'm, I'm so sorry, and also again, he had that set up. You you know that now as you look back, the big margarita, all the things. Oh no, I got her. All that, yeah. He had that set up, and it had been set up for a long time. But again, but like, I and I trusted him because I knew him so well, and I was like, yeah, Zach, it'll yes. be fine. Don't worry about it. You know? Well, you trusted him because you came from a cult that told you to trust people mm -hmm. uh, as long as they're Jehovah's Witnesses, right? You automatically distrust someone like a Zach because they're worldly. But if they're a Jehovah's Witness, then they are, you know, there's no way they can be um, a predator, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the fact of the matter is all Jehovah's Witnesses are predatory, within their religion and the way they prey on vulnerable people. So you have a predatory religion that accepts predators in other ways as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really sick and sad. And I'm so sorry that people like you and I mean, so many other people that I've talked to mm -hmm. um, have been hurt by it because you're taught to trust somebody like this. And of course you didn't see anything wrong with the Apple watch and all the things because it, you would never even think that coming from the organization because they've set you up for failure. Yeah. Yep. And actually, so cool. I frequently forget about this, but um, I also, nothing uh, physical ever happened. It was always just emotional. But I even remember when we moved to Tennessee and I was, at the time, by the time this happened, I was 15. So I was still young, obviously, but not old um not legal <laughs> and there was a brother in the congregation um call him m and i remember i had a huge crush on him i thought he was so cute and i was 15 so whatever you're allowed to do that and then his mom facilitated that he told me that he liked me too and that he wanted to marry me one day and i we used i we used to like exchange like letters back and again, nothing like romantic in it or anything. It was always just like us just talking, whatever. But I remember his mom used to tell me, yep, he wants to marry you one day. And then like a couple years later, they moved congregations because his dad, I think, got this fellowship. And, uh, and uh, I never heard from him again. But I remember like even as a witness, when I like a couple years later, when I turned 18, I was like, what the fuck was that? How <laughs> like, old was back, he? He was at the time 26. He was 26 and you were 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So like even that, like, again, nothing long-term damaging. And at the time, again, I was young and ignorant and didn't know it was like bad or wrong. But now I look back and I'm like, damn, like, what was that? That's messed up and being co-signed by adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, my parents found out about it though at one point because they found the letters and they were Fury, not with me. They were not angry with me at all. I'll give them that at least. Okay. Um, but they never like. I think it was actually no. That's what made them move. Sorry, I this part of my life I've blocked out apparently. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember they they found out about it and called him out, like called him and like called him out because he was tight with our family and come over all the time. Um, and so they like called him out about it, and that's when their their family moved congregations, and I never heard from them again. 
And I remember like, I literally had like a countdown on my phone of when I would turn 18. Cause I knew I was going to date him at that point. And it was like three years away. <laughs> so all Ooh. good. Love it. It's, it's funny too. Cause like, I was thinking about doing this podcast, and like listening to all these people's experiences. And I always have thought to myself, man, I had like a pretty normal life, except for the fact I was a witness and then I like start talking about it and thinking it through. And I'm like, actually, this was bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, when it's all, you know, growing up, that is your norm. Mm-hmm. When you start reflecting back on it, you know, and I can't tell, you know, in my coaching practice and such, when I work with people, you know, sometimes I've helped people to see this was abuse. This mm-hmm. was abusive. This was not healthy. Um, it doesn't mean that it's all bad, but that's part of what's confusing about abuse is that abusers aren't abusive 24 mm. seven. There's that they can be lovely, genuine people at times too, but that's what makes it confusing and abuse. And, um, when we look back on our life as Jehovah's witnesses, there were genuinely good times. And I, I don't want anybody to throw those away because, you know, I, think those can still be good Mm -hmm. um but that's also part of what keeps us stuck sometimes clinging on to a thing because of those good moments Mm -hmm. but we we didn't want it to be what it really was and we sometimes live in a little bit of denial about that which Mm -hmm. is normal and nobody wants to think that they were surrounded by predatory people or that we ourselves in going out door to door, we're preying on vulnerable people. Oh, you you lost someone in death? Hey, do I have the tract for you? Like, that's horrible to think back about, but we all did it because we were all in this really, really dysfunctional, messed up, alternate reality. It's such a strange thing to look back on, yeah. you know? And, and now for you, looking back, it's not normal for people to forced their 26 year old son on 15 year old girls that's weird unhealthy (laughs) toxic you know shunning just like zach not understanding the shunning thing (laughs) because it's so awful your average human can't wrap their mind around that yeah for sure it was yeah it was crazy times yeah it, sure. it, 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 it's so wild to look back on and i'm i hope when you look back on this there's some catharsis and seeing both sides of it and especially the fact that you know because there's the environment but then there's you and yes you were surrounded by a lot of people who uh, maybe sometimes did not have your best interests at heart or um, were just downright awful Uh, as well as some genuine caring people in moments. Um, But you are the one who was bigger than all of that. And you were the one who came out of that and is making something of your life today, which we'll get to, you know, where you are. But, you know, we are the ones who outgrow that dysfunctional, tiny box, controlled, um alternate reality we outgrow it and they're the ones who are stuck left behind not because we left them behind we just grew and they stayed behind that's that's not on us yeah i don't agree but it's also on a it's it's on us just in the fact that it shows something about us all that we they were not able to stamp us out we have something about us that has allowed us to get out of this situation and to move on at whatever age we were able to do so. Mm -hmm. And that's still a beautiful quality in us, regardless of how much time we spent in in that mess. Yeah. Um, And I feel for the people who are still there because they're victims too. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I, so I, like I said, kind of still thought that was the truth. I might go back one day, but sure. I'm not at that point anymore. We're going to talk more about that. But that's one of the things about my family is like, I tell people my story, not in such depth, but I do tell people my story pretty frequently. And um, there's always, I mean, everybody's always angry. Like there was, I don't remember, uh, 
Oh no. I saw I, one of your podcasts that you interviewed. Um, I think it was a great spiritual heritage was the name of the episode. Oh yeah. Oh. I related to that guy hardcore because I think he was talking about his daughter and how she's still a witness and he, she doesn't talk to him. And he was like, yeah, but I don't, I don't hold it against her. Like that's what she knows. That's what I used to do. That's just, you know, it's not her fault. It's what she thinks is right. And that's kind of, I, that's the first time I'd heard another ex witness say that. Cause every, I do have one friend who I grew up with in Florida, who's now also not a witness. Um, she came out as gay and, or I guess as a lesbian and um, is no longer a witness. And so we've reconnected and we're, I wouldn't say like really close, but like we're, we're close and like still talk to each other. She came to my wedding. Um, and so uh with her, like she, I would say is very upset with her family, like very bitter um, about things. And I totally get why. And her family is also a very interesting mix of people. And she has her own background, of course. Um, and so like, it was always hard for me to talk to her about our, our past though, because I had such a diff, like she was one of those people in the congregation who my family for sure was like, that's bad association. Like she was disfellowship when she was like 14 um, and then came back, got reinstated, and then got is now disfellowship or no she actually did the uh uh thing where you write the disassociated herself oh yeah um and so uh but anyway so she was always bad association and had like a rough bit bringing her family was never strong and so like she just is is better at everything whereas for me like i had i i'm not angry at my family for treating me the way they're treating me because i did i also did this to people when i was a witness and when i believe this was the truth so how can i be angry at them for doing a thing i did myself too and so i just feel like this is what they they do what they think is right and i mean i know for a fact it's not easy for them to not talk to me i know they're suffering just as much as i am from not talking to me and so the fact that they have such strong faith in something even though it's in my opinion, wrong and hurtful to a lot of people. The fact that they have such strong faith that they're willing to go through that pain every day, I almost respect. Like, cause I don't think I could do it in some weird way. I know it's probably not great, but like, I'd rather have a positive outlook than be angry every day that they're not talking to me personally. Well, and I think that's the, that's again, back to the duality. Um, and in people that I, I, I work with in my practice, um, there are some people who uh, are very angry and they can, and I think that anger is good and justified yeah, because it, it means you respect yourself. And so, and that, you know, you were wronged. And I think that that's a good thing to have, but then to work on balancing that with some acceptance of the realities of where the other person people were in the situation. In other words, nobody wakes up one day and is like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to join a cult and I'm going to fuck my family. <laughs> right. Nobody does that. But what people do is they have good intent and they think they're helping, but they fall into the wrong thing. And it ends up being really harmful, but now they're too far down the path and they can't see it. They're blind to it. Mm -hmm. And so can we have some righteous indignation and anger, you know, because we ourselves did deserve better and balance that on the other side a little bit with some understanding of the fact that our parents are just human beings too. Mm -hmm. And they screw up just like anybody else. Um, and they come from where they come from. Everybody comes to where they are in life, honestly. But then I have people who come to me who have all the compassion in the world for their parents and are super like understanding of that side, but have to learn to feel their own feelings because we were taught not to feel our feelings as witnesses mm -hmm. um, and to, to really uh, dignify and honor themselves in this process as well, not just you know, oh, mom and dad, they were good people, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's okay. It, it's kind of not okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I think as a parent, right? like, how is it not immediately a red, an alarm bell to you or a red flag to you that you're not talking to your kid for four years? Yeah. Like, how are you not immediately up, like, maybe I shouldn't do this thing where I can't talk to my kid? <laughs> you know it's I mean yeah. that's the thing is like I I have a friend who just had a baby and I'm like like she knows my background and she said to me the other day she was like I my baby's a month old and I cannot fathom a day that I would not talk to them 
can't. And I'm, I think that's, I definitely have my angry moments. Like I think the angriest I've been was when I, I wanted, I told myself I wanted to extend an olive branch and that I never wanted to regret not doing this. So I invited them to my wedding. I just sent them, I knew their addresses. And so I just sent them wedding invites and they both, not only did they respond, but they intentionally responded and RSVP'd, no, I will not attend. (laughs) And I wasn't surprised. I was not, I really wasn't. But I definitely, and I knew that was going to happen. And yet somehow I still was just like, you couldn't even come and just sit silently in the back and not talk to me and just see your daughter get married. Like you couldn't. It still hurts, doesn't it? Just that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, of course, because it's so unnatural. And, but again, some, and this is what I see people get stuck on probably more than anything is that desire for, for familial relationships, particularly with our parents. And, um, this, oh, you know, kind of gets to a little bit of the difference between love and approval. Um, mm-hmm. We were taught to seek the approval of others, uh, which means to change or be what they want us to be so that they will accept us rather than being loved on the other side for who we are, where we don't have to change. And our parents, you know, they are Jehovah's Witnesses, so they are going to conflate love with control and approval and and that's how they see the world and so it's you know part of our path of healing is to be able to honor both sides part of healing is being able to hold both things both our feelings for ourselves and our i kind of also understand like for me uh my mom was patient zero And kind of fuck her for bringing that into our house. I'm being very, you know, honest about my feelings here. Like, I have some of that in me. Like, I was a kid and I didn't deserve for my life to be turned upside down at eight years old because you had a bunch of unmet unmet needs and traumas that you hadn't worked through. And you joined a cult and took me down this path and wrecked me for 30 years. That is not okay. But on the other side, I also have to say, yeah, I get it. You went through all this trauma of your own and you were very vulnerable and you fell into the wrong people. And I don't think your intent, and intent matters, your intent was not such to destroy our family, but you did. So, (laughs) you know, it's kind of trying to hold both things. I think that sentence is what really my feelings towards my family is built upon the intent matters. Yeah, intent matters. I'm angry. Like, I am angry that they don't talk to me. I am hurt by it. And I, and all all of that. But it's also, I don't want to say there's closure, because don't get me wrong. I hope one day I'll be able to talk to them again and that they'll come to their senses. Um, but that being said, like, I know their intent is that they think this is the right thing to do and that it's what's going to bring me back to Jehovah. Um, and again, like from the beginning, I thought I was gonna, I genuinely thought I'd probably end up being one of those people who got this fellowship and then got married to the worldly guy and then got reinstated and had an unbelieving spouse. I thought that was going to be me. Um, and then I left and um I was like I'm gonna go to meetings every now and then like I'm gonna kind of keep this up like I still think this is the truth and then I got my first taste of no expectations and freedom and oh I don't have to go to the meeting this Sunday (laughs) I don't have to study the watchtower um and just stopped and didn't go anymore and then after a while like of just distancing myself which I know I remember when you talked about like in your podcast like how a lot of people who go to like uh, um, foreign language groups and stuff like are the ones who will sometimes leave because they're not getting that daily feeding of yep. spiritual food. And so when I, as soon as I stopped getting that spiritual food every day, I started to see the holes in everything. And actually this was huge. One of the people I worked with at the time, his wife is a, uh, has a doctorate in religious studies here at UT and she is a professor there who spe- or, uh, specializes in religious cults. And the three that she specifically focuses on, one of them's witnesses. And so he knew I was a witness. And he, I kind of told him when I left, and he was like, hey, my wife kind of wants to meet with you. Like, would you be interested? And I was like, yeah, sure. 
And so I went and talked to her and she's, I will say, she's extremely religious. Um, They both are. And they're very devout in their beliefs. They're kind of all over the place with what they believe, but they're both very uh, religious. So that doesn't line up with me. Again, spoiler alert, I'm an atheist uh, now. But um, she sat me down and was like, hey, so like, let's talk about what you went through. Cause she actually is apparently uh, she was telling me that she's met with and coached several witnesses who have left. And she gave me this really great book that I'll have to look up the name of, but um, she uh, was like sat down. I kind of like expressed to her everything I was expressing to you about like what's gone on and how I'm trying to now like figure out what I believe and how I still think I believe a lot of this. And I was very fresh out of it. I still think I might go back, but like, I'm angry because this is how things have gone and what's happened to me. Um, and it's very fresh. And she was like, all right, well, like, let's sit down and like talk through a lot of these beliefs and like, kind of like figure out what, where you want to land. And so she went through like a lot of things with me. Like, um, I'm not going to lie. I don't remember most of what she showed me, but like about like the Trinity and, um, like that's honestly the main thing I remember. I don't remember what else we went through, but, um, she basically was like showing me like why the witnesses are wrong, why the new world translations wrong and how uh, manipulated it's been uh, versus a lot of original texts and how she's like, yeah, witnesses tout that like, oh, hey, look, we have this original copy of this thing and it's exact translation and everything. And in reality, no, that's not what it says Mm -hmm. Um, and things like that. And so that was like the first real like crack to my foundation of like, oh, this is a lie. This isn't right. This isn't true this isn't the truth um and so that was kind of like a big moment for me of like oh I don't know if I do want to do this or go back to this and so I didn't really do anything else with that I started to read the book she gave me um which was helpful and then eventually like I said I did find your podcast and found that really helpful and so that kind was of that this JW like, life or yeah this JW this JW yeah. life and um those both kind of like continue to like wear away it of, of just like because again like I was like oh everything's like normal like my life su- or my life was great I just had this bump in the road where I didn't want to do this thing anymore but all of that was fine and so like having the outside perspective of people being like no this isn't okay and here's why it's not okay and I was like oh that wasn't okay <laughs> <laughs> um and so uh I that all just started wearing down on it and then eventually um I told Zach I was like I kind of miss having like religion or like a community like I didn't have a lot of friends like I had a couple friends that I was close with but not a lot and obviously I had Zach and then my roommate who I moved in with Allie one of my best friends she was the maid of honor on my wedding I love her um she's amazing that was again stroke of luck to have gotten so many great off of off of Craigslist we joke about that all the time about how we would never tell anybody to go on Craigslist for a roommate but that we lucked out um, we were both just desperate and in very interesting moments of our life. I was going through that and she had just found out her fiance was cheating on her. And so coming out of that relationship and we both were just very, we needed people to lean on. So it was good for us. But, um, anyway, so I just started to, uh, look for like a non-denominational church to go to, to maybe like test the waters and kind of see what I wanted to do. And like, I started, we went to a couple of meetings at this one church that Zach had used to go to, gone to, which, um he grew up kind of religious his mom was a little bit religious his dad wasn't very religious his dad died when he was 12 um and then his sister was very religious I don't know where she got that from but she's very very religious and just Christian I don't know that she has a specific denomination um but he's always disagreed with religion and kind of had like atheist thoughts but never like had the I guess you could say courage to act on that because he'd always been told like you gotta be Christian it's what you are sure. um, so he kind of like believed it but kind of didn't and just thought a lot of it was too like touchy-feely kind of a thing um so he was willing to like try going to the church he used to go to and we went to that and I had a like full-on panic attack because it just reminded me so much of a witness meeting and I mean it, it wasn't the same like they did the whole like live band thing and like uh you know, it was very like casual service and whatever, but like, it just was triggering. Sure. I realized, yeah, I realized that I could not do this and did not want to do this and that I had been okay for so long without religion. Maybe I'm still okay with this. And so we talked and we agreed we would not go back. Um, So we didn't. 
And then we both started to, I started to just research and like look up different religions and thoughts and everything. And after reading it a lot and then digging a lot into, um, I guess you, I guess atheism is kind of a religion or lack of religion. I don't know what you'd want to call it. That belief system. I think um, some people are religious atheists. Yeah. <laughs> so I started to just research make that and I listened to like, I basically went back to school, so to speak, in, in terms of like the science side of things. Like I decided to like dig into the big bang and evolution and just all of that. Cause I never learned about any of it. Even if it wasn't my textbooks, I Googled the answers, who knows? Of course. Right. Um, so I uh, dug into that and I was like, this makes sense. And then I started like Googling things that like scientifically showed why the Bible wasn't true in certain areas and like kind of digging into that. And there definitely I mean, just came a point where I was like, yeah, this is bull crap. I'm out. <laughs> and uh, finally, when I kind of decided that Zach agreed, he was like, oh, good. Like, and he felt like there was a weight off his shoulder because he was like, I want to be, I want to be able to identify as an atheist, but I just have been so nervous for so long. And you, I wasn't sure what you wanted to do. And um, so when I said, like, I don't think I'm into this, he was like, oh, good. And right off his shoulders, we both kind of agreed. All right. Like, this is kind of what, what we believe now. We've kind of dug into that. We both gotten like a little bit into, um, like a uh, more, um, I hate the word, this is the witness in me. I still hate the word pagan, um, but oh, okay. we've, gotten, we've gotten into like a little bit into like Wicca and like more pagan things like that. And um, I wouldn't say we're practicing, but that's something like we both find interesting. And specifically there's um, the name of it's uh, called a naturalist pagan to where like you believe in like energy from things that are alive, but you don't believe in like a god or a, a, any power or anything like that so like you are still an atheist but you just believe that nature carries energy in it that's kind of like that's what zach specifically has decided he identifies as. i kind of lean towards that um and agree with that but um overall i i definitely don't don't believe in the bible <laughs> anymore well yeah and you're not going door to door preaching uh that as the truth <laughs> or trying to convert yeah. anyone to it that's your path and the, the beautiful thing is that now you and Zach get to explore your own paths together mm -hmm. um as you as you wish uh, how long has it been now since you've seen your or talked to your parents how long yeah so that's the other thing so I was just fellowshipped at the end of November 2018 so I think that's been a little about four years ish um and uh my, so when I was disfellowshipped, obviously I was working at the mortgage company. And so uh, I was working there. Um, Zach was also working there. My brother at that time and my sister-in-law had moved to Idaho. So they weren't at the company anymore, but my dad was still there. And he still is to this day. And I still work there as well. Um, Zach left another company in January of this year. But um, I've taken a couple of promotions and I've never been in the technology department that he's in. But it's one big building. And I mean, when I was first disfellowshipped and even when Zach was still working there, we see him around the building all the time. Um, walk by him on our way in, walk by him in the hallways, like see him in the cafeteria. And you just sometimes like you could tell, especially early on, like we slip up and like smile at each other. And then we'd be like, oh, and kind of like look away and realize, oh, no, we shouldn't. Shouldn't we make an eye contact? Um, oh, and you get to smile and, and make eye contact that's all true. you want. I should just it, stare it, him down. It's he who uh, has to look away. Yeah. So I, uh, so we we still see each other, saw each other. When COVID hit, all of our department was, uh, or all of our company was sent home to work from home full time. And I'm back in the office full time now. And I have been for about a little over a year, but I haven't seen him. So I think that he stayed home full time. Um, but I do know he still works there because he's still in the directory. And one of my friends who's in the technology department every now and then will mention that she's working with my dad on something. So I know he's still working there. I think he's just at home now. Um, so not to see him very often, which is nice. But yeah, I haven't like we've when I first left, I just wanted to go to college, uh, did not go to college. I looked into it. Oh, this is good. So I couldn't afford to go to college. And I was 22. And so you have to either be, I think, like 24 or 25 or married to be able to qualify for assistance without having to put your parents' income down. Uh. Um, so I wanted to go to college. I put in an application for assistance. And I they had like a section for like if you're not in contact with your family. And so I, I marked that and then it immediately like shut down the 
survey thing and said, hey, you're going to have to meet with the admissions office to go over what this means. So I was like, okay, go down and meet with the admissions or the, uh, I guess it's the admissions office, the the college assistance sure. section, whatever. And so go and meet with them and they're like, hey, you checked this on the thing that you don't have contact with your parents, but like you're not married and you're under 20, whatever. Um, so like we're going to need that information. Like what's the deal? Like are you uh, orphan? Like what? what is it? And I ex explained it all. I was like, well, um, I'm not my parents' religion. So they've like uh, basically shunned me. Like I don't have any relationship with them. I haven't talked to them in two years. Um, and they were like, okay, well, you're going to need to get their information because from what you've described, um, you could talk to them. You're just choosing not to because you're not willing to be the same religion as them. Yeah. Um, so I emailed my dad and I said, Hey, I'm trying to go to college. I am trying to better myself. I tried to be able to apply without your information. They will not let me. Will you send this to me? And he did. He emailed me back and just said, here's my, whatever I asked for. He said, here's this, please delete when you're done. That's all he said. He sent me my information, spoiler alert. He makes enough money that I did not qualify for any assistance, even though don't talk to him. So I did not, I couldn't afford to go. So I never went to college, but honestly, kind of glad I didn't um, at this point now. Um, but anyway, so did that. That was one time I contacted them. And then whenever I would move, I would send them my updated address and they would just say, thank you. Um, and then recently they moved and sent me their updated address. And I just said, thank you. Um, so that's it. And then, like I said, I sent the RSVP for my wedding, both my brother and my parents, and they both said no. Um, and that's, that's the last time that's, that's it. The last time I heard from my dad was probably the beginning of the year when he moved to just another area in Knoxville. So that's it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, just you saying that about the updated address, I hadn't thought about that. Like, I don't even know where my family lives. I have no idea where any of them live. So. I, I will admit I stopped uh, sending them my updated address when I moved to our current house because I was like, what's the point? Yeah, uh, I don't really, I don't know where my family lives, but at this point I don't mm -hmm. really, you know, I've, I've grieved that loss. Mm -hmm. um, I'm dead to them. They're dead to me. I've moved on. And uh, if they're resurrected someday, that'd be awesome. You know what I'm saying? If, if they if they leave Jehovah's Witnesses and they they come back to life, okay, and we can have a relationship. And I, mm -hmm. my door is always open. But uh, yeah, it's it is it's a weird thing that most people don't have to don't have to try to figure out how to grieve the living. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in your own, so if you could say anything today that you wanted to your family what would you say? I thought about that a lot. Cause that was, there was like a, only like one or two questions on your, or on the list that I like really felt like I had to put some thought into ahead of time. And it was this one. And then just like, what have you learned uh, mm -hmm. since your time out? But um, it's pretty short and sweet. Like I would just tell them that I love them and that I miss them and that I would love to talk to have rekindle a relationship with them someday if they're ever willing. And that's really it. Like I, I'd like them to know I'm happy that's something that I feel like I'm proud of every day and that almost does feel like a jab to them, even though they don't know really probably, is that I'm happy. I'm not dead in a ditch somewhere. I'm not alcoholic. I'm not addicted to drugs. I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not any of the things that they say you'll become if you leave. Um, I'm a health, healthy, normal person, I guess, in society. I mean, obviously I have some cool, like, goals like I, I'm we're trying to um you know move into a camp or do tiny home life and that kind of thing and I do think I have some interesting goals and my own unique person but like at the end of the day like I'm have a healthy relationship um this person that they thought was going the worst thing that could have ever happened to me is the best thing that ever happened to me um we have a healthy relationship we have an awesome house we have great dogs we have a uh, good work. We have a great friend group. I have made my own family. Um, I'm happy and things are going well. And I would love for them to know that and feel bad that they're not involved in it and don't get to see it every day. So maybe that's a little spiteful, but. <laughs> yeah, well, but it is, it is a shame. I mean, um, 
I think you grow so much after you leave, if, if you put in the work, that uh, they really do miss out on the best of us in many ways. They miss out on the real us. Uh, a lot of our parents really don't know us and have never really known us. Uh, they weren't interested in who we really were. Um, and so it's just a shame that they don't get to see that. But I'm glad that you are, are living your best life. I mean, certainly, you know, people leave and, uh, you know, just statistically, there's going to be people who are going to struggle and then there's going to be people who are going to do well and, it's, it's going to run the gamut, and we've all been hurt in many ways, and that's going to come out in different ways in people's lives. Um, but it's always nice to see somebody who's been able to, to move forward and have some nice things in their life and some nice people and find support and supportive individuals and, and dogs. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and that is, you know, truly finding happiness because, I mean... Everybody deserves a chance at happiness, but certainly those of us who grew up in a cult uh, deserve a chance at some happiness, don't we? I mean, I think we we earned our stripes. You know, we we, we had a, a miserable life for some time. At times, I know you had some good times too, but uh, the opportunity to fully be ourselves is something everybody deserves. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I, <laughs> I intentionally keep all of my social media public because I... Again, I like the idea of thinking that they're checking up on me and seeing how well I'm doing and feeling shitty about not being there. So, well, I, I would almost guarantee you that they probably are. So, um, I mean, uh, I do it to them. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is there anything, any lessons you've learned uh, since leaving? You said that was a difficult question for you. you know, some of the things, anything that's really helped you? Um, Honestly, like I, I still don't really know how to answer that, I guess. I think that for me, learning. what's been really helpful is just, again, I'm an open book. I'm a vulnerable person and sharing my experiences with so many different people, I think has also helped me really bring uh, the word that comes to mind is closure, but I don't know if that is the right word. It just has helped me put things in perspective. And so being vulnerable and willing to share these experiences with people is something that I've learned is really helpful and beautiful. And like, it brings you closer to people. It helps them understand you, but it also gives you a good perspective of how you, what you've gone through or what people have gone through. It's similar and help you make these interesting connections. And so that's something I think I learned early on is that <laughs> sharing is caring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've really enjoyed doing that. And then also, like another thing is that um, I think that being, I guess this ties to the vulnerability thing, but like being real and being okay with, um, I don't know, like not being nervous to share who you are with people and, and that kind of thing, even if you don't want to be vulnerable and go into detail about things. But it took me a while to be comfortable telling people like, yeah, I haven't talked to my family in a, a little while just because like I didn't, a big thing for me was my dad worked where I worked. So I didn't want to tell people they're because so people knew my dad worked there and that I worked there and that we were related for me to suddenly be like, yeah, he, we don't talk anymore. Like, um, but then there came a point where I was like, you know what, he's going to explain whatever he wants to people if they ask, and I'm going to explain whatever I want people to ask. And so just being true to yourself and being okay with that. And, um, I don't know. I think that was a, another big thing to learn. Be patient with yourself. Let yourself take time to figure out who you are. It took me a long time once I left to like, like a big thing for me is my style. Like that's how I express myself. And so like for me to figure out what that looked like for me without that pressure of like, you need to look a certain way. Um, right. and how I express myself and what my goals are and what I'm interested in. And I think the other thing to do that I think is healthy personally um, is to also appreciate like what you have learned from being a witness. Like, um, like for instance, witnesses aren't big on having kids because they think you need to dedicate as much time as you can to the ministry and to Jehovah. And that's something now that Zach and I don't want children. And I think that for a lot of people, that can be something that's not normalized to them. But for me, that was always normalized. And so I think I appreciate that about my upbringing um, or to not be materialistic. I appreciate that about my upbringing because it's made me more um, financially stable now um, and appreciate experiences and things like that more. And so um, I guess another thing is like, don't 
focus on the negatives that have happened. Like there are good things you've gotten from this. And if nothing, if nothing about your experience was negative, you've at least gotten the positive knowing that you're strong enough to get out of it and to build a new life without it. So Mm -hmm. it was a big fix for me. No, well, I appreciate you bringing your vulnerability to the podcast and sharing your story uh, to help others because, you know, I mean, part of the grooming of being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is if you leave, just shut up. (laughs) Don't tell anybody about this, right? Mm -hmm. If you leave, be keep quiet about it. And um, we were made to feel very alone. And so being vulnerable, being able to express yourself in a healthy way to people who are the right audience for that is a very beautiful thing to be able to do in our lives. And I'm glad that you did it today. And now you can help others yourself. Sounds great. I hope so. I think I think that'll be good. Um, that's a sorry. I'm just gonna keep going. Apparently, um, something else I've done that I think is cool and kind of from that is we have a DEI program at where I work, a diversity, equity, and inclusion program, and um, I'm a volunteer member of that. And like every year, we do something called a very boundless holiday where we celebrate multiple holidays. And last year. Um, I petitioned that we should have a, not celebration, but like we did this thing last year called everybody should have a seat at the table. And so they did like a big table set up in each place setting was for a different holiday. And I was like, we need a place setting for people who don't celebrate. Cause I know when I worked here and I was a witness, I felt like you, I didn't want to be here around holiday times because it was just so many holidays shoved in my face. And as somebody who didn't celebrate, like at the time that was so uncomfortable for me. And I felt like people thought I was weird because I didn't celebrate. And so they did that. We added a place setting for those who don't celebrate. It was just a plain, plain place setting. And then we had a display board on what it was for and why different people may not celebrate. It's not, might not, might not even be related to religion. It could just be maybe they had something traumatic happen this time of year. And Lots of people you know, don't like to celebrate. celebrate. There's a lot of reasons, yeah, to not celebrate. But that was for me personal for, for why that was. And I was just really touched and honored that, my company was willing to have a seat at the table for people like me who didn't, even though I do now. Um, But uh, that was really, really cool. And since then, this coming year, we're planning our next uh, boundless holiday. And so this time we're doing like rooms that are decorated for each holiday. So you can experience what it's like to be in a house that's decorated for that holiday that's celebrating it. And I'm in charge of doing a room for those who don't celebrate so that it can kind of be an oasis for them of, of getting away from all of the holidays and that kind of thing. And so for me, my I know my dad still works here. And even though, again, I don't think witnesses have it right personally, and I think that there's a lot of unhealthy stuff going on, but I know my dad's still a witness and I still love him. And I like knowing that I'm doing something at the company who works at that he can enjoy like he will now have a space that if he's in the office he can go to as an oasis away from this because it's not what he believes and everybody's beliefs should be respected to some extent hmm. uh, so. interesting respecting other people's beliefs and <laughs> something for your dad who doesn't know, respect what anyone else believes hey i'm the i'm the bigger <laughs> person though because of it <laughs> <laughs> well that is i mean yeah that is uh an example of uh, it could be an example of doing something to to help others, even if we don't agree. We can disagree, and we don't have to be disagreeable. Unfortunately, yes. uh, your dad has to be disagreeable and uh, doesn't respect anyone else's beliefs. <laughs> but that's that's part of being one of Jehovah's Witnesses He'll, and being in the cult. He's disagreeable if you've been baptized. Well, uh, of course, well, you know that's. He's going to talk to people if they weren't baptized. But right. That's just being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And also, do we know that if you had never been baptized, he wouldn't have ended up shunning you anyway? I mean, I think he would have, but we'll never know. I I, I think so, given the nature of, hey, that girl down there in Florida wasn't disfellowshipped. What the fuck? (laughs) Uh, I, I, I think that kind of shows a certain nature of, Hey, let's do this thing and let's make sure that we, you know, let's do jump right. to fun, right? Yeah. And and you know, my family was the same way too, right? And and my my parents shunned me before they ever had to. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the end, you know, again, you're being you, a reflection of who you are in this moment, and that's that's a good thing. 
Mm-hmm. And um, like you said, there are people who don't celebrate for many, many reasons. And again, you are allowing yourself to be vulnerable with apparently a company in this case that appreciates and honors vulnerability in those mm-hmm. those respects. So that's a really cool thing. And um, <clears throat> I hope it helps other people who aren't uh, able maybe even to speak up for themselves sometimes. Mm-hmm. So good for you. Thank you. Yeah. And good for yeah, you for again that. for speaking up here today. <laughs> Thank you.